of the independent peer of the independent peer review of the Southern California Coastal Water Research Projects coupled remote ocean monitoring system and biogeochemical elemental cycling model. Let's go to our next slide. I'm Kevin Hardy, the executive director of the National Water Research Institute. Uh, and welcome. This has been, uh, uh, we've been at this process for over a year, kind of planning for this series of meetings and looking forward to uh, setting the, the tone today for a productive and efficient uh, review of this model and making investments to make it even more productive. Next slide. Uh, a few meeting guidelines today as we go through this online meeting, and I want to welcome everyone again, say thank you for participating. But as we as we move through the day, we, we find that if you mute your microphone when you're not speaking, it's it just works better for everybody. It preserves bandwidth and it prevents embarrassment and other things. So turn your mic off if you get a chance. Of course, the corollary to that is we all forget to turn our mic back on when it's time. So uh, don't worry. We, we know that is part of the dimension of this meeting uh, format. Uh, be present, minimize your multitasking, however you can do that. Everybody's got a different approach. We appreciate that diversity. Uh, please do the things that you do uh, to be present and minimize your uh, minimize distractions. We're going to facilitate today to prioritize the panel questions. That's really what we want to do today. Well, our, 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 our intent with these first two webinars is to provide a baseline of understanding for the panelists so that our meeting in person in Orange County in January will be productive. So it's very important today that we facilitate and prioritize the panel's questions. If we have time for the questions, we'll definitely get into that. My sense today is given the depth of the material, we, we may not, but we'll do our best. We will though monitor that online chat feature so that uh, so that if you have a question and you place it in the chat, we'll at least be aware. And if we can't get to answer it today, we'll try to answer it uh, in the follow up to the meeting. And we wanna thank all of you for supporting NWRI. It means a lot to all of us. Next slide. We already mentioned that this meeting is being recorded for note taking purposes and we'll delete that recording when we are done. Next. I want to tell you a little bit about NWR. Again, I'm Kevin Hardy, the executive director. I have I came to NWRI in April of 2017 after a 30-year career in water and wastewater, mostly in San Diego County. Uh, but I've been really uh, pleased uh, to have the opportunity to lead NWRI because NWRI is a model, a national model for the collaborative advancement of water resources science, policy, and innovation. We are the independent advisory services provider of choice for the most challenging water resource management, water quality and regulatory issues. And I believe that's how we find ourselves here today. And we strive in this engagement and all of our engagements to provide unique insights that are valuable for our international community of practice. Next slide. One of the most important things that we do at NWRI is award the Athlete Richardson Irvine Clark Prize. The Clark Prize is one of the three most prestigious international awards in the field of water science and technology. Uh, those aren't my words, although they were today. That someone else wrote that. I thought I said I'm going to use that as a quote. Um, and also, we, from a background standpoint, we awarded annually, and we've now given 30 of these prizes to a practitioner who demonstrates sustained research excellence, and importantly, translates that research into meaningful improvements in public health and environmental resiliency. The laureate receives a distinctive gold medallion and fifty thousand dollars in cash. Uh, the 2023 laureate is Charles T. Charlie Driscoll. He's a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Syracuse University. And for, for some of you on the line, you'll, you'll know who Charlie is. Uh, for others, you may not. Uh, but Charlie was the, one of the leading uh, professionals who initiated the characterization of acid rain in North America that turned into uh, multilateral action that resolved a problem, uh, an environmental problem that was uh, caused by man's activities. And this could be a model for some of the challenges that we face today, but it, importantly, uh, Charlie uh, did what all Clark Prize laureates do, which is demonstrate sustained research excellence, in this case about acid rain, and he translated that into meaningful improvements in public health by taking multilateral action across many countries to help resolve the issues of, global, of uh, acid rain. And, and frankly, what's interesting now is that Charlie's even moved into the next realm as the solutions to acid rain have had their own interesting environmental impacts. So it's always a circle we're working on and uh, we want to enjoy uh, and rather invite each of you to the uh, Clark Prize ceremony in Irvine this fall. We'll see more information about that soon. Next slide. 
I want to take a moment to introduce our independent peer review panel members. And, and when I do, I'll have you chime in one other time uh, again for me to make sure your audio continues to work. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Gordon Zhang from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, who's agreed to serve as the chair of our panel. Uh, Gordon, we're very appreciative of, uh, of your agreeing to this extra effort. Uh, Gordon, would you like to say a few words uh, to the group? Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, this is Gordon Zhang here. I'm a physical oceanographer at the Woods Hole here in Massachusetts. And so happy to serve on this panel. Thank you. We have a number of experts and they're uh, distributed around the world uh, fairly evening, but evenly. We have people in North America, we have people in Europe, we have people in Asia. So across the Northern Hemisphere, we'll move first to Europe and Neil Bannis, who's a PhD at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland. Neil? Uh, hi, everyone. It's uh, uh, just uh, happy for the opportunity to be part of this process. Thank you, Neil. Next is Fei Chai, a PhD from and a member of the faculty at the University of Maine. Fei? Hi, everyone. Uh, after 28 years uh, at the University of Maine, serve as a faculty. Uh, last uh, fall, I retired and uh, from University of Maine. Currently, I'm based in Xiamen, China. It's a 1 a.m. at 10 minutes <laughs> past 1 a.m. here. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us, Fei. Margie Fredericks from the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences. She's going to join us late. Margie's a, a star in this area, and you'll enjoy her, uh, and you'll notice her participation uh, right away when she joins us. Uh, Margie, welcome. Uh, next up, I want to introduce Mike Stuckel from Florida State University. Mike? It's a pleasure to be here, everyone. I'm uh, an open ocean biogeochemist and ecologist, and I've been working in the California Current for I guess about 15 years now. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you being here. And last and certainly not least is Alexander Kuropov, who is with NOAA up in uh, Seattle. Uh, Alexander, are you there? Oh, hello. Uh, I'm in NOAA, still in Spring, Maryland, actually. And uh, yeah, I just want to, I'm a physical oceanographer, modeler. Uh, <clears throat> came here to Lyon, <laughs> more about biochemistry. And I, uh, on the slide, it's a very selective. Uh, group of uh, people I, I have known for years and uh, I do appreciate the, the invite. Thanks, looking forward to this meeting. Thank you. Uh, before I move on, I, I want to point out the, the process just a real briefly about how these panelists were identified. We went through a stakeholder led process that identified the experts that the stakeholders thought um, uh, were excellent in the fields of, of relevant science that were important for this independent peer review. As we went through those two lists, we found a number of people and most everyone on this list appeared on both lists. And if they didn't, they, they, they satisfied a number of different uh, scientific and technical expertise areas for the panel. So we're very blessed to have this incredible panel and wanna thank not only you individually, but as a group, I appreciate you serving and supporting NWRI. Next slide. Here are the goals of our independent review. Um, we worked on these a little bit as a group, try to uh, focus them in a way to make them broad enough that they were goals, but integrated enough that they made sense and created a process. So the goals of the independent review are to assess the model's readiness, to answer management questions, to advise a model uncertainty associated with addressing those management questions, and recommend next steps for improving the model's readiness. So you can see that we have a kind of a and improve a process that we're intending to try to move this model you know, further along in its developmental state. These are our goals. Next, our, our objectives though for today, as we begin this process in earnest, is to familiarize our panelists with uh, the state's perspective on and in, in their investment in OAH modeling, to introduce the coupled model and to facilitate Q&A among the modelers and panel, to present the regulated community's perspectives on the model and facilitate related Q&A, and then we'll have some time to conduct a private facilitated panel discussion on the materials presented and to gain consensus on key elements of the webinar to agenda. And while we have a plan for what we believe would be the appropriate uh, content for webinar two, that will be further informed by what we learned today. Excellent. I won't spend too much time on this agenda because I've already uh, gone over my time, but we, we do have a busy agenda that goes from nine to three. Uh, we're in the welcome. 
And next we'll introduce uh, our, our reps from the State Water Board and the Ocean Protection Council. We'll move into the modelers and then talk uh, here from the regulated community. And uh, for everyone other than the panel, we should be finished up at 1130. Next slide. So with that, I'd like to introduce introduce uh, first our, our first speaker today. And uh, what I'll do is I'll introduce Jonathan. John will let you conclude your comments and then uh, we'll introduce Jen. Uh, Jonathan has served as a chief deputy director of State Water Board since 2007, where he oversees the Division of Water Quality and the Division of Financial Assistance, among other responsibilities. Jonathan worked for the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board for 23 years before being named executive director of the board in, 20, in 2004. Some highlights of John's tenure with the board include development of a new program to investigate sources of groundwater contamination, the development of a comprehensive water quality data management system, and the adoption of the first urban trash TMDL in the nation. Jonathan received his Bachelor of Science degree from env in environmental engineering with an emphasis of water quality from Humboldt State University. Jonathan, take it away. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, and hopefully my comments will be pretty um, um, short because your goals are really um, my first um, question and for the panel is really, is the model ready to make management decisions? As from the water board's point of view, we make decisions based on um, incomplete and um, data all the time and information, we, we have to um, because we never have all the information we'd like to make decisions. Um, I will give you a little bit of, of background when um, the Ocean Protection Council and the water boards were considering this um, modeling exercise. We were somewhat under the impression that um, ocean acidification impacts that we were seeing were likely due to global CO2 emissions and upwelling, but we felt it was really important to eliminate um, point source discharges as a um, contributing factor. And so we were um, actually quite surprised when the initial results came back that um, that the models were showing that point source discharges from POTWs mainly were having a significant and uh, effect on uh, ocean acidification. And um, that since that's what we can control, that's indicated to us that at least to the water board, and I will let Jen speak for Ocean Protection Council, that um, we need to be moving forward with um, management approaches to address that concern. Um, I guess my, what I'd be asking the panel is, given the, um, the uh, review of the model, do you believe that, um, that it is um, substantially correct? I understand that models are, um, have, you know, there are estimates there. They are not going to give you the exact answer and that there are always going to be uncertainty associated with that. But is that uncertainty um, going to mean that the model is, um, you know, the changes in the um, in refining the model are going to be on the edges or are they going to completely overturn the, um, the results, the um, conclusions that you can draw on on the impacts associated with the point source discharges. And um, if the model is on the edges, then I think we need to, to begin the process of um, figuring out how to correct that, what kind of management um, approaches we need to take. We need to, um, I don't believe we have time to wait forever um, to refine the model to get it exactly correct. Um, and I think that was really pretty much my um, contribution that we, looking at this model, we think that at this point we need to take action and we want you all to be thinking about, is that, are we ready to do that? 
And I think I'll leave it at that and I'd be happy to answer questions at some point. John, thank you very much for sharing the Water Board's perspectives. Gordon, I'll ask out loud if there are any questions for, for Jonathan before we uh, uh, turn to Jen. And not from me at this moment, thank you. Check the q and think we're looking, not seeing any questions, so good. Let's go to the next slide and I'll introduce Jen. Jen Eckerly is the Deputy Secretary for the Ocean for Oceans and Coastal Policy and the Executive Director of the Ocean Protection, Ocean Protection Council for the California Natural Resources Agency. Jen is uh, serves as a key advisor to the governor and the Secretary for National Resources and directs policy, scientific research, and critical partnerships to increase protection of California's coast and ocean. Jen served as OPC's Deputy Director from uh, December of 16 until October of 22. Before joining OPC, Jen spent eight years as an ocean policy analyst for the National Resources Defense Council, where she conducted technical analyses and developed policy recommendations to advance ocean conservation. Prior to that, she was a coastal program analyst for the Coastal Commission and the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission. Jen earned an MS in marine biology from the Florida Institute of Technology and a BS in biology from the University of Vermont. I'd like to introduce and welcome Jen Eckerly of the California Ocean Protection Council. Jen. Thank you so much for that great introduction um, and the invitation to join you all here today. Um, I'm going to, I have some slides, so I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. Um, and then you can tell me how we're doing. We are now seeing your screen. Thank okay. you. Okay. But I can't see my notes. So hold on one second. Okay. We good? We can see your slides. Perfect. Okay, so thank you again um, for the opportunity to be here today. For those of you who are not familiar with the Ocean Protection Council, otherwise known as OPC, we're a cabinet level state policy body created in statute and nested within the California Natural Resources Agency. Um, and as Kevin said in my introduction, we serve as the governor's advisor on coastal and ocean issues. Uh, the executive director of the Ocean Protection Council has two roles. So we serve um, as a leadership of this organization and also as deputy secretary. So we've got this really unique um, structure within state government. Um, and we have a seven member council that includes the secretaries of natural resources uh, and the environmental protection, the chair of the state lands commission, two members of the state legislature and two public seats. And we work to protect California's coast and ocean by advancing innovative science-based policy and management, making strategic investments and catalyzing action through partnerships and collaboration. We have this very ambitious strategic plan that guides our work through 2025, focused on four key goals, addressing climate change for ecosystems and coastal communities, advancing equity, protecting coastal and ocean biodiversity, and, and supporting the sustainable blue economy. Goal one <clears throat> of our strategic plan includes a focus on addressing ocean acidification and hypoxia. California's coast is experiencing the impacts of climate change. We're seeing marine heat waves and temperature increases impacting California's marine ecosystems and severe harmful algal plumes events, uh, both in the bay and offshore waters have resulted in the de deaths of tens of thousands of threatened fish species, have impacted fisheries, and have left hundreds of marine mammals stranded along the coast. Ocean acidification and hypoxia are among the web of threats facing California's coast and ocean. The Ocean Protection Council has long committed to understanding the impacts and causes of ocean acidification and hypoxia along the California coast to inform management decisions for our state waters. Our strategic plan includes an objective to minimize causes and impacts of ocean acidification and hypoxia and, to, and targets that achieve that objective, including establishing water quality objectives for OAH based on the latest scientific research. I wanna provide a brief overview of ocean acidification and hypoxia and why this issue is a key priority for Ocean Protection Council. I know I'm speaking to a group of experts here. 
Um, but OA decreases ocean pH and hypoxia is the decrease of ocean oxygen. Both are affected by natural processes and anthropogenic impacts. The figure on the right shows the direct impact, the direct relationship between increasing carbon dioxide concentrations due to fossil fuel emissions and the decrease in pH. The California coast is also particularly vulnerable to OAH due to natural processes such as upwelling, uh, lower pH water, um, uh, where lower pH water, as seen here in the darker colors, rises deep uh, from the deep to the surface. The impacts of these natural processes on OAH are exacerbated by those driven by increased carbon emissions, global climate change, and as we've seen from the modeling results, anthropogenic nutrient in inputs. OAH is a problem for ocean ecosystems because it per prevents marine life, such as oysters, Dungeness crab and pteropods, pictured here on the bottom right, from properly developing exterior shells and can also cause existing shells to dissolve, both resulting in impacts to individual organisms that can also cascade up the food chain. Shell dissolution in juvenile Dungeness crabs in the Pacific Northwest have been observed by scientists far so sooner than original projections. Additionally, evidence suggests that ocean acidification impacts impairs the uh, ocean acidification impairs the sense of smell in salmon, impedes growth in herring and other critical prey species, and can affect plankton populations. All of these impacts present serious threats to California's coastal and marine ecosystems and the coastal communities and economies that rely on them. Given the consequences of these impacts to livelihoods and ocean health. Ocean Protection Council has prioritized efforts to understand and address the impacts of OAH in California over the past decade plus. Sparked by the devastating failure of oyster hatcheries in the Pacific Northwest between 2006 and 2009, OPC has taken meaningful action to invest in critical research and monitoring to better understand the causes and impacts of OAH and strategies to, for adaptation. The West Coast Ocean Acidification Science Panel convened from 2013 to 2016 by the Ocean Science Trust, established an important foundation of scientific recommendations to understand and address OAH in California and along the West Coast. In 2016, California was also one of the founding members of the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification, which brings together governments and organizations across the globe dedicated to taking urgent action to protect coastal communities and livelihoods from the threat of, sea of ocean acidification. Following the passage of two key pieces of legislation, Senate Bill 1363 and Assembly Bill 2139, we increased strategic investments and policy action to address this issue, leading to the establishment of the California OAH Science Task Force in partnership with Ocean Science Trust to guide OPC decision-making and ensure further action on OAH is supported by best available science, adoption of the state's OA action plan in October of 2018, which includes recommendations that are directing our strategic plan actions and recent investments, and targeted investments in modeling, monitoring, and research. The project at focus of this effort is OPC's longest and biggest single OAH investment. Starting in 2013, Following the recommendations of the West Coast OAH Science Panel, OPC provided funding to support the development of a coupled physical biogeochemical OAH model for the entire West Coast to help managers better understand the implications of OAH for marine resource management and to determine to what extent local nutrient inputs are exacerbating acidified and hypoxic ocean conditions. The project has been co-funded by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and represents a scientific collaboration with UCLA, the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project Authority, and Princeton University, among mul multiple research institutions and over 20 scientists. The model is now considered a state-of-the-art global example and has resulted in numerous peer-reviewed scientific publications. In the Southern California Bite, this effort has demonstrated that coastal anthropogenic nutrients, mainly from wastewater treatment plant effluent, are having a significant impact on OEH in this region. 
To that end, OPC has continued to invest in this model and OAH monitoring and research priorities consistent with the recommendations of the California OAH Task Force, including additional work to better understand impacts to biological species, the impact of nutrient management and recycling, and the relative roles of climate change and natural variability. In particular, recent funding is supporting coordinated and standardized collection of chemical and biological ocean acidification data across key existing California and West Coast uh, monitoring programs. And the, those you can see here in the figure, as well as an OAH portal for hosting and serving data and information. The goal is to have a coordinated network of monitoring efforts to provide OAH information on status and trends used in, for use in decision-making and adaptation and mitigation efforts. Together, these investments are critical to help the state meaningfully address the impact of OAH on our coast and ocean. And with that, I wanna thank everyone um, for your time and just reiterate uh, the comments that you heard from Jonathan Bishop. Um, we think that uh, this model is demonstrating some pretty important findings that are uh, triggering the need to take management action to protect California's coastal um, ecosystems. So looking forward to hearing more of the panel discussion. Thank you. Jen, thank you. And uh, again, I'll, I'll ask Gordon, uh, any, any, any questions from, from you, Mr. Chair, or the members of the panel? Um, I do have a quick question for Jen. Oh, first of all, thank you, Jen and John, for the uh, the um, the presentations. Really um, explains the the context very well. Uh, the so Jen, for in your presentation, you really emphasize OAH. So um, for the impact of this um, point source on the you know coastal uh, environment, there could be other impacts. I think it's, do how we supposed to focus on OAH, or should we also consider other impacts? Oh, I mean, maybe that's the project. I guess once we get into the uh, later presentation, we might see more of that. Yeah, and I, I will admit that I'm not 100% um, clear on the scope of the evaluation of this group. But what we really want to understand is whether there are management decisions uh, and actions that we should be taking to minimize the impacts of OAH from this, these nutrient discharges. Okay, great, thank you. Um, that's all I have, but I guess I would like to see whether other panelists have any questions here. This is your opportunity. Anything else for Jen or John? Well, I'm sure I know they're going to be around. Well, John's going to take off. Uh, if, if it does come up later, maybe you'll be around to, to answer that question. Jen, thank you yeah, very much. Kevin, uh, I, I probably have to jump as well, but Justine Kimball, our senior scientist um, who is part of the steering committee, is here and can answer any questions. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that context. It kind of sets the stage, gives us the, the why we're here, and I really I do appreciate that. And so now we're going to transition from uh, thinking about perspectives on why to start to get into the to the to, to the technical part of this work, and um, I really appreciate uh, the level of detail that uh, we've had to go to get this point, and I appreciate uh, how busy all the people who we've already heard from this morning are, and frankly, how busy all of you are, and that you've agreed to spend uh, this three hours with us today as we learn about this model and. Uh, as we transition to the modelers and thinking about uh, what they've done and kind of providing an overview, giving us a sense of where this model's at in its current state of development. Uh, we're gonna bring on Martha Satula, who's the head of the Southern California Coastal Water Research Projects Biogeochemistry Department. Martha, uh, in this role, oversees projects related to the effects of climate change and anthropogenic pollution on acidification, hypoxia, harmful algal blooms, and eutrophication. Her research group combines the use of observations, experiments, and numerical models to understand drivers and ecological impacts of these phenomena in streams, lakes, and estuaries, along with coastal waters like the bite. Beyond her research activity, she focuses on linking science to management. Examples of her work include uh, being, working as a lead scientist uh, on the California State Water Boards uh, and supporting technical support on this project, on other eutrophication work, and uh, water, other water quality objectives for the state of California. Dr. Satula received her BS in chemistry from Purdue. 
She's got a master's degree in public health from Tulane and earned her PhD from Louisiana State University, uh, working with one of our Clark Prize laureates. So um, with that intro introduction, Martha, welcome. We uh, looking forward to learning more about this incredible work. Take it away. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that tee up, Kevin. And um, uh, first of all, welcome to the panel members uh, on behalf of the science team. We really appreciate uh, your service. We understand the commitment that, that's involved. So thank you for that. Um, I'm pleased and proud on behalf of uh, a large team uh, to present an overview of our ocean numerical modeling work that we've been doing to support um, climate change and coastal water quality conversations on the California coast. Uh, as Kevin said, I'm the head of the biogeochemistry department at SCORP, and I'm one of the principal co-PIs of this project, but I think what should be apparent is I'm essentially, um, I'll call it the science communicator in chief, probably you know, the single person that from an end to end perspective can speak to this work, um, although none of it is mine. It's, and so if um, you know, I want to make sure that we credit the people um, whose work this is, and also if there's any mistakes, they're all on my own. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so you just heard from uh, Jen and John that really kind of queued up and provided some key context for this work. And I'll repeat just quickly, just to say that we recognize as all over the world, um, our West Coast oceans are, are increasingly experiencing ocean acidification hypoxia. We are one of the um, global hotspots um, in terms of rates of those two processes. Um, the Ocean Protection Council clearly is investing, um, interested in investing in strategies to mitigate um, the effects of uh, acidification and hypoxia, and that reducing human nutrient inputs because of the linkage to eutrophication and declining pH and oxygen, um, that can be one of the consequences of eutrophication, that was identified as one potential strategy. Um, but uh, understanding that on our California coast, this is an this is an upwelling, an eastern boundary current upwelling system. So it was not a foregone conclusion that such a strategy could be useful. You heard that from John. In fact, when I got here 20 years ago, um, the reigning conventional wisdom is that upwelling was naturally high in nutrients, low in pH and oxygen, and so it you know it's was really doubted that any uh, land-based inputs of nutrients, particularly from human coastal populations, could matter at all. Um, and so ultimately, um, the, the question is, you know, does it matter and where could it matter, understanding that um, anthropogenic nutrient inputs also vary substantially along the coastline. So this is sort of a key grand, sort of grand science um, question that was queued up for the group, understanding the importance that if they're, you're talking about some of the management decisions that John and um, Jen referred to this morning, that that could cost billions of dollars. So um, so what uh, the West, a West Coast ocean acidification and, hy and hypoxia expert panel recommended back in 2016 was that um, the West Coast states and California took on this challenge, uh, should be investing in an ocean numerical model. So Jen said this is, you know, one of their largest investments in science that they've undertaken. And the reason why the panel um, emphasized the, the use of a model is that only a numerical model can really help us to disentangle the, the processes that are contributing to um, are changing pH and oxygen along the coastline, understanding that natural variability is large, this is an upwelling coast, but then really helping us um, understand how we can compare the magnitude of those local anthropogenic nutrient inputs and coastal eutrophication to that um, to the um, the variability um, that's there naturally, and then superimposed with changes um, from uh, from global climate change. So uh, our numerical modeling project um, was intended then to really take on that grand science challenge to address the recommendations of the West Coast OAH expert panel. 
And the goals of our, um, of our research project were to develop and, val and validate an ocean numerical model and then to apply that model to begin to investigate um, the effects of local anthropogenic nutrient inputs on acidification hypoxia and its biological effects. And then as we um, move from model development to validation and then on to application to start to use that model as a decision support tool um, in a sort of transparent science-based process to support the conversations um, of coastal water quality and natural resource managers around these strategies of water quality management and climate change. So uh, to just to give you a quick introduction um, to the leaders of the, the team here, uh, this is a program that's probably now in its uh, 10th year um, coming up. Uh, there have been greater than six institutions um, uh, with um, postdocs, greater than, than 30 scientists have been um, collaborating together. And that there's essentially four main institutions, um, the first two of which um, were UCLA and Princeton, which represented the, um, the cornerstone of our physical and biogeochemical modeling expertise through um, Jim McWilliams on ROMS and Curtis Deutsch on the biogeochemical elemental cycling model. Um, we had a team of scientists dedicated to um, compiling and um, supporting our team on observations, namely uh, Dick Feely from NOAA PMEL, as well as, as well as Karen McLaughlin from SCORP, who was the head of our Southern California Bite Regional Monitoring Program. We had a component of the project dedicated to um, interpreting the model with respect to biological effects, both as, in terms of ocean acidification, led by Nina Bedarsnik, who um, was at SCORP during uh, the tenure that these tools were being developed, and she's since moved on to Oregon State University, and then Curtis Deutsch on aerobic habitat or oxygen effects on the environment. And Christina um, Frieder is a team member that has been working to pull these um, pieces all together in terms of how they would um, ultimately be applied through that model. And then the, the final piece of our program is model application. And we've uh, specifically to investigate the effects of anthropogenic nutrients. And that work has been proceeding through two geographic foci. Uh, in the Southern California Bight, the work is being led by Faisal, Faisal Kazuri here at SWERP. And then Daniele Bianchi of UCLA is leading a parallel effort in the San Francisco and Monterey coast. So this is our team. Um, and you'll, it's worthwhile uh, introducing them um, virtually for the moment because you're going to be reading a lot of their work as well as interacting with them over the next um, uh, several months. So I was asked to give an overview of our science program. And so what we wanted to try to do with this talk was really to try to give you a vision, a blueprint of our science program so an overview of the body of the work that's been accomplished, but somewhat narrowed um, by the topics of interest of the steering committee. Um, and so that the, what you're gonna be hearing for the next 20 minutes or so is really the, the context and the approach of that science, not the findings. And the reason for that is that I think it really helps you to have that roadmap as you're undertaking your reading um, your suggested reading in preparation for the upcoming panel meetings um, to provide you with that context and understanding how all of this essentially fits together. So um, I hope that the talk is successful um, to meet that goal, and I would encourage you folks to um, stop me if you have any questions. Okay, so here's the roadmap, um, essentially three pieces. And I'll jump in and first talk about the modeling approach, the setup, and the um, approach to validation. So the model itself is essentially comprised of two main components. Um, there's a physical component and a biogeochemical component. The physical model is the regional ocean modeling um, uh, system. It was essentially a physical model that I don't need to tell this panel about ROMs. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's essentially a model that it, um, that predicts how the ocean water circulates um, in response to um, the forcing from the atmosphere as well as the greater um, Pacific Ocean. That is coupled with the biogeochemical elemental cycling model, which is essentially a um, a model that takes in nutrients from land as well as the uh, from oceanic sources, and then predicts how that fuels the production of the lower trophic ecosystem plankton. That ultimately, as that um, that organic matter is uh, transferred through the food web and um, is degraded or respired, it consumes oxygen and lowers pH. And so these two modeling pieces then can be put together and, uh, and um, run through their paces in terms of the types of simulations that can um, help us understand climate change as well as the um, effect of anthropogenic nutrients. But ultimately, there's one more really important piece to this which is these models predict seawater chemistry, but we need biological effects. Um, and that's what the managers are interested in. And you heard that from both Jen um, and uh, John this morning. And so the third piece of our, uh, essentially our approach that you'll be hearing about on uh, uh, in the upcoming uh, webinars and in-person meetings is essentially the, the way in which we developed biological thresholds and indices to predict the effects of seawater chemistry on marine life. So these are the three pieces that I wanna spend a little bit of time on this morning talking about how they were developed. So, ROMS is not unique to the California coast. This is a global model, um, but I think it's worthwhile pointing out um, uh, just for the panel's benefit, what are the key attributes of the UCLA ROMS um, that, um, that are important uh, to pay attention to as you go through your review process? First of all, uh, Jim McWilliams is one of the uh, I think leading developers of ROMS and the California coast has been a test bed for his research program for decades. So the model that you are taking on the review of is not a model that was developed specifically for this project. It's been uh, tested through a variety of research and management applications at multiple scales for decades. Um, the second important point, and this is um, uh, I think something that is um, very particular to Jim McWilliams' approach to his science is that he's very interested in essentially as a physicist, um, an, an ocean physicist, really interested in the um, reconstructing and understanding the ocean, um, uh, the physics of oceanography from first principles, that this model is mechanistic. Um, it is. It does not. Uh, it does not assimilate data. And the reason why that man that matters to a, a water quality manager is that it actually allows us to use the model to disentangle the pathways of impact with a fair amount of confidence um, that you understand um, how how we're attributing it to, let's say, climate change or um, uh, or natural upwelling or ultimately anthropogenic nutrient inputs. The third thing is that over the course of our collaboration with UCLA uh, over the past decade, what um, the research is really focused on from the physics side is really understanding how we can bring these models closer to shore with increasingly fine resolution. And the McWilliams team um, is essentially set up this model in a way that uses a series of nested grids that capture the phenomena at spatial scales that range from mesoscale currents that really we're trying, we're talking about kilometers in scale, all the way down to plume dispersion that can happen on scales of, of tens to hundreds of meters. And so the way that they did this is that the full model domain that's, that was set up was actually at the West Coast California current ecosystem scale. Um, it's at four kilometer resolution. That's the horizontal um, a resolution of one model grid side, um, one model grid cell. So that's how we refer to our, the spatial resolution of the model. Um, and then the, the model then is nested with uh, higher resolution grids inside, scaling from one kilometer at the scale of the, Calif um, the California coast, shown here in blue. 
um, and then can proceed all the way down to meters depending on the application. But I want to point out specifically that when we are simulating the effects of land-based nutrients, that we uh, do so at three out of 300 meter scale within the Southern California Bight and the San Francisco and Monterey Coast. So again, these sort of nested grids allow us to model the processes that we're looking for the effect of anthropogenic nutrients um, inshore close to the coast, but still have a, a fair amount of confidence that we're getting some of the major oceanographic um, uh, circulation patterns and forcing it to the model uh, correctly. Okay, so on to Beck. So Beck is the biogeochemical elemental cycling model. Um, this is an uh, what's referred to as an intermediate complexity model um, that captures the um, the nitrogen, carbon, uh, phosphorus, and oxygen or carbonate system. Um, mass balance and chemistry of, of the ocean and the way it cycles through the seawater as well as um, the, the plankton, the phytoplankton as well as the zooplankton. And so the, this model in particular um, was um, uh, the choice that the team made because it captured the key management points of interest, in particular what's happening with the stimulation of algal blooms or algal productivity, and then how that cycles um, uh, uh, with respect to the carbonate system or, or pH and oxygen. And it includes or features a, a, a mechanistic representation of those processes that ultimately control those endpoints. The second point um, I, that we think is important to communicate is that Beck um, has its origins in global modeling, but it was updated specifically with enhanced nitrogen cycling and carbonate uh, chemistry, and it was parameterized specifically for our coastline. Uh, the third point is that, um, so these are large, uh, um, large model domains. You know, a lot of uh, space. Uh, we're, we're essentially trying to model a large geographic scope, um, but we still felt that it was very important to be able to have a realistic representation of the feedbacks between the physics and the ecosystem, and that for that reason. Um, uh, Beck is coupled online to ROMs um, and solved a, a, and its differential equations solved at a time step of seconds. So this is then computationally intensive, but we feel it gives us a more uh, realistic representation of the biogeochemistry of the coast. And then finally, um, the forcing of the model with respect to atmospheric inputs, as well as land-based inputs, is uh, spatially uh, and spatially explicit and realistic. For example, within the Southern California Bight, where we're at 300 meters, where the model is forced with land-based inputs, we have um, we have compiled monitoring data uh, for 20 years at roughly a daily time scale um, with respect to hydrology um, and monthly to seasonal time scales for the for the chemical constituents in a way that essentially um, uh, allows us to represent the inputs um, uh, that vary spatially with respect to land-based inputs along the coastline. <clears throat> okay, so um, as is the case with many models, Brahms Beck went through sort of a, I guess I would call it a typical set of uh, development and validation stages. Uh, which essentially there are three. Um, the initial stage is model testing and verification. Is the, mo is the model code doing what we think it should be doing in terms of its numerical representation of a process? The second um, phase is sensitivity analysis. So when we begin to understand our model and we're testing it in three dimensions, how sensitive are the model outcomes, the state variables? are two unknowns and how we're parameterizing, um, parameterizing that model. And then the third stage is performance assessment, um, which you know, ultimately I think sort of speaks to three questions. Uh, these modelers are research scientists and so they have basic questions about what the predictions reveal about the physics and biogeochemistry. 
And first and foremost is that sort of is a reproducing observations and that are published in literature and, and often even revealing re new phenomena or new understanding about how the ocean um, dynamics um, are proceeding. So beyond that, what we, what we really um, emphasized in our performance assessment, number one, um, how to model predictions, um, compare against observations of those state variables. So the ambient uh, concentrations of oxygen, pH, um, et cetera. And then number two, how do the how do model a model predicted rates um, for the different types of transformations that the model is predicting? How does that compare with observations of rates? And when we use those two in tandem, what we are are shooting for is to um, try to understand whether or not we're getting essentially the right answer. Um, and, and not only the right answer, but we're getting it for the right reason, um, if we're essentially constraining both these observations of state and rate. So this is the overarching approach that the team took um, uh, towards uh, model development and validation. And then what was emphasized um, as, you know, over the course of about six years as the team proceeded through this exercise depended on scale. So I referred previously in the slide that we had the initial model domain was set up um, at a four kilometer West Coast wide scale. And then what we had within the Southern California bite in particular, and that is the focus of these panel proceedings at 300 meters where we're simulating the effects of land-based inputs um, into the Southern California bite. And so at the West Coast scale then, in the initial testing and sensitivity analysis, um, what the team really worked on was essentially the basic Beck parameterization and the coupling of ROMs with a numerical atmospheric model called the weather research forecast. So you'll see uh, the mention of that in some of the papers that we've suggested that you read. And so then as the model then um, uh, was tuned up and as we began um, doing simulations, the performance assessment really focused on whether or not the model was getting the basic gradients in ocean physics and biogeochemistry as well as the atmospheric interactions coastwide, was it nailing that? As well as looking at the temporal patterns on a, on a seasonal, to uh, interdecadal or inter interannual, excuse me, uh, time period over um, essentially a decade of, of simulations. So then as we transition from a West Coast wide scale to a Southern California bite scale, then what Faisal Kazuri did as he began to parameterize the inputs of the land-based forcing, he spent quite a bit of time uh, testing and doing sensitivity analysis on the on the representation of river and wastewater plumes. And then the performance assessment essentially repeated those broad scale gradients in ocean physics and biogeochemistry within the Southern California Bight, but then focused down and looked more specifically at the anthropogenic gradients, uh, including the vertical gradients in oxygen and pH, um, as well as um, a representation of primary production, the cross shelf and longshore um, gradients. And then we looked from plumes around rivers and outfalls all the way up to sub-regional scales. Um, the temporal patterns essentially repeated what was focused, what was the four kilometer focus West Coast wide. But now we understand that um, the job that we have to do is see whether or not that the model is able to capture the temporal patterns in climate state in that interannual variability, um, as well as the changing nutrient regimes that are coming from land and the way that the coastal population has grown, but yet there's also been some nutrient management. So ultimately, um, what we want you folks to pay attention to is that there was a first um, publication that described the model setup and the validation or uh, the performance assessment. But now we're working on an update um, to that performance assessment that is not yet uh, completed. 
um, this performance assessment covers, covers a more recent period that reflects the changes in, in lamb-based um, uh, lamb nutrients, as I discussed. It's essentially a repeat of the pre previous sort of core approach that you'll find in the Kazuri et al. James paper, um, but now more um, focused on the Beck state variables and adding as a, um, as a focal point, the offshore, um, and because of the geographic, I'll say, locale of, the, of interest in some of our recent findings. So previously we focused onshore, and now in this um, more expanded or updated uh, assessment, we're looking um, across, um, across the coast. And then finally, we're also adding uh, uh, new data types that the community invested in. So for example, we now have the ability to look more specifically at the model's ability to reproduce time series from moorings, as well as even new higher quality pH bottle data, which was um, previously one thing that um, stood out um, and that the stakeholders wanted to be able to um, make some investments in. So we're going to be able to update you on our progress on this updated model validation at the January 17th meeting, um, uh, where while we would expect to have something written up for you, probably in the late spring to early summer. And so we'll be talking with you guys about the timing of being able to provide you with that material. And so uh, as I go through now, what I'm essentially doing, uh, we provided the panel with a suggested reading list. Um, and I'm just highlighting in this slide, I won't, uh, read, <laughs> won't read it for you, but I'm highlighting what are the papers that you may want to point your attention to in order to um, uh, read up on these topics moving forward, specifically the foundational papers on ROMS and Beck that West Coast scale model setup and performance assessment, um, both on the physics and biogeochemistry, as well as the setup and forcing and performance assessment um, that we've done for the Southern California Bite. Okay, so while the modeling team um, was working for several years on the model development and validation, we had a parallel program uh, to develop tools to interpret um, the uh, essentially interpret the biological effects of ocean acidification and hypoxia. So why did we do that? Bottom line is that um, hopefully it, it's apparent now that the model is uh, really predicting changes in seawater chemistry. But what you heard from John and Jen today is that the managers really want to understand, the importance of the of those predicted changes on biology. The model um, is a three-dimensional model. It has 66 million grid cells, um, and we average it, average it on daily time scales to start looking at those uh, trends in seawater chemistry. What does that mean for biology? How do we interpret those changes? And so we needed a framework for how we would start to translate those effects, both res with respect to depth and time um, um, and space. Um, and so that's what we undertook the effort to do. And in interacting with managers, one of the key concepts that emerged was that what we could really start to speak to was the degree to which changes in seawater chemistry were actually causing uh, a compression of the habitat capacity for shelled organisms and for aerobic habitat for fish and other organisms. Ultimately, the changes that are being predicted uh, particularly with respect to anthropogenic nutrients, are occurring in the in the top 200 meters of the water column. And so what we were interested in doing is finding a way to um, essentially predict how that changes the volume of habitat that these critters have to carry out their life cycles, um, you know, in, in terms of what may be lethal impacts or sublethal. So ultimately, in order to quantify that habitat compression, we needed oxygen and pH thresholds that were biologically informed. And so we, um, we undertook a, a, a multi-year effort then to develop ocean acidification thresholds. 
um, for a OA in particular, um, our approach was really to lean in on existing published research. So we undertook a data synthesis where we focused on three major taxa, pteropods, echinoderms, and decapods. Mm -hmm. um, we synthesized um, uh, uh, over 135 published laboratory and field studies, and then convened workshops of international experts to uh, essentially go through um, those studies, review and get consensus on um, thresholds of, um, of, of ocean acidification that would range from lethal to sublethal effects. And not only were, um, did this process produce thresholds, it also produced a mechanism to assign confidence to each of the thresholds in order to communicate to managers um, uh, what sort of certainty the experts had in being able to put um, um, a, a number um, on a threshold for any particular pathway of, a, um, of effect. And so here's an example of what that synthesis product looked like for pteropods. Just a couple things to point out. We were able to get consensus on what was the right metric in terms of whether or not it was pH or or a saturation state here. Um, they um, proposed a ragonite saturation state. And then we were also able to identify thresholds um, for a bookend effects ranging from mild exposure, dissolution, um, all the way to, um, to, to lethal effects. The approach to developing oxygen thresholds um, was different from that, um, from ocean acidification here. We leaned in on the work that, that was done by Curtis Deutsch, um, in which we used an ecophysiological eco approach called the metabolic index. And the reason why we're using an index, um, instead of something like oxygen concentrations, ultimately because concentrations, let's say if we use the, the lethal limit for hypoxia in water, ultimately ignore the temperature dependency of both the ambient water in terms of how much is available to a species, as well as the temperature dependent um, demand of any organism um, as it's living, breathing, and doing what it needs to do in the ocean. And so the metabolic index um, is essentially represents a ratio of that supply to resting metabolic demand. Um, it's um, the Quantity phi depends on the physiology of the organism as well as the en environmental conditions. There's no need to get into the, the equations at the moment, but ultimately it's a species specific index that gives you some um, uh, experimentally measurable um, or measurable uh, estimate of hypoxia tolerance, tolerance that incorporates the temperature dependence. So when you take these two approaches, what you can still do is pull them back together and develop essentially a bookend of effects that brackets the potential changes in habitat cap capacity all the way from something that represents lethal effects or where you're having um, reproductive effects all the way to limits that are, um, if you sort of envision um, this habitat capacity as a response service, all the way to the levels of ragonite saturation state and the metabolic index phi, um, where you're actually um, able to start to support healthy populations. And so these um, these bookend effects then um, become a way um, for us to begin to query and look at the model outputs for how um, we're ultimately um, going to be able to use them to predict habit habitat capacity. Okay, so in order to prep uh, for this discussion, we would recommend um, looking at both um, some of the background materials on ocean acidification thresholds, um, as, as well as what was developed for oxygen indices. And there is uh, quite a bit more on your reading list um, that includes uh, applications as well as the fundamentals of, of the index or um, the thresholds themselves. Okay, so we're moving on to the third part of this talk, which is applications to investigate the effects of anthropogenic nutrients within the Southern California Bight. 
Um, and so there's sort of two pieces of this, you know, what is published and then what is ongoing in which um, we have not yet um, um, uh, uh, put out manuscripts and therefore um, it's good for you to know, uh, know about it, put it on your radar screen, but it may not be the preliminary focus. Okay, so thus far within the Southern California Bight, the model has been applied to answer three basic management questions. Number one, what is the effect of human nutrient loads on algal blooms, oxygen, and pH? So essentially, what's the effect on seawater chemistry? The second question then is, well, what's the biological effects of those changes in, in seawater chemistry? And so those two pieces together are sort of um, the fundamental questions. And then third, the model has um, begun to be used to support management conversations. And so one of the first scenarios that we were, that we were requested to do out of the box is to use the model to uh, investigate or predict what the potential effect of management actions such as nitrogen reduction in, in ocean outfalls um, that was that could be done either alone or in combination um, with scenarios of reduced wastewater volume that represent how um, the coast is starting to move towards potable water recycling. Okay, so in general, for all of these three questions, the way that the model outputs are used um, to predict these land-based nutrients is we start out, we really are working with sort of two types of scenarios. First of all, we have an ocean-only scenario, which represents just the um, oceanic processes and atmospheric um, deposition, as well as global uh, CO2, air-sea exchange, but there's no land-based inputs of nutrients. Now that scenario then is subtracted from um, another scenario, the same time in which now we're adding the effect of land-based inputs. And so if we're doing a difference analysis, then that difference can be attributed to, um, to essentially land-based inputs. So this is the basic approach that, under, um, that underlies uh, a lot of the, the analysis that you're going to be uh, reviewing. So in terms of this first question, the approach to predicting the effects of land-based inputs on biogeochemistry, um, it's helpful to sort of understand the vintage of work that we proceeded through. So in terms of what is um, already published and um, available online, we had the initial work um, in which we simulated for um, ocean ocean um, state and anthropogenic inputs from two decades ago. Um, uh, the effects of um, uh, anthropogenic inputs on seawater chemistry. The geographic uh, focus of that work, um, first and foremost, was inshore um, because we were looking for where the effects that were more proximal to the sources of nutrients coming into the coast. And what we essentially focused on in the, uh, the paper that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences was essentially just the change that we were detecting. What is that basic change that's attributable to land-based inputs? Um, with the more recent work that um, Faisal has um, uh, uh, put together, and this is in review in uh, uh, Nature Scientific Reports, it's a more recent um, a set of simulations reflecting um, uh, more modern nutrient loadings. The focus of that um, work is not only inshore, it's also offshore. And then Faisal, in response to some of the questions that the managers had, um, repeated the change assessment, but then added a biogeochemical mass balance analysis to really um, get to the bottom of an understanding of what is the linkage of these land-based um, inputs with the effects that we're predicting, and you know what are the particular mechanisms that are responsible for that. For the second question, Christina Frieder um, has led on um, predicting the biological effects to um, habitat capacity for shelled organisms and for aerobic habitat for fish. And so we started with these same um, bookends of thresholds uh, for acidification and for oxygen loss using aragonite saturation state and the metabolic index. 
And then what Christina did then is applied those thresholds to the simulations with and without land-based inputs, um, calculated the depth to um, the, the threshold, and then did the difference analysis um, in order to uh, calculate the net, net change, whether that re represented an expansion um, or a compression of habitat. So then she quantified the, the patterns that she saw over nine years of, of model simulations that bracket that 20 years of, um, of changing ocean state and ch changing nutrient management. And then the other thing that she did, um, be, um, ultimately there is no sort of policy decisions on what thresholds to use. And so she actually did a sensitivity analysis on the um, choice of threshold uh, and on the index in order to understand how that mattered um, for the findings that she was summarizing in this paper. So the last then question that we took on, um, uh, again, responding to managers who are asking us to run scenarios to really begin to investigating to investigate possible actions. What we did was we used the model in sort of an idealized experimental mode where we um, focused, so the, the, the inputs stayed the same, we kept the rivers, we kept atmospheric deposition, but then we focused um, our sort of idealized experiment on the ocean outfalls in which we had a, a series of scenarios in which we reduced inorganic nitrogen ranging from no reduction all the way up to 85%, um, representing a sort of advanced nutrient treatment. And then at the same time, we did that in combination with reduction of outfall discharge volume, going from no reductions all the way up, um, all the way down to essentially a 90% 90, 90 reduction in volume. Uh, relative to um, present day levels, um, keeping nutrient loading constant. So the idea then is you're playing with essentially maintaining the mass loading um, constant in that second set, but then you're varying essentially the strength of nutrients um, um, inside uh, a, a reduced volume going into the coast. And so we looked at both effects on seawater chemistry as well as habitat compression. Um, understanding that ultimately these first scenarios were a range finding exercise. They were bookends um, um, with no intent to optimize or try to find the right balance of, of, of nitrogen reduction relative to uh, water recycling of that ocean outfall um, freshwater volume. Oops. Okay, so uh, what to focus on are suggestions. Is, our, is that you um, take a look both at the chemical effects assessment as well as the biological effects assessment. And then the, um, this first application of the model for management scenarios um, is uh, actually now in press in scientific reports. This is the work that Mina Ho led. Okay, so I've sort of taken you through um, uh, a feeling, at least at this point, of you know what is our published work across the board um, for the last ten years. But we have also quite a bit of ongoing work, um, and I believe it also speaks a little bit to um, Dr. Zhang's question about the scope of what is being asked to review. Um, so. Um, ultimately, um, I think that we have sort of three areas that we're working on uh, in tandem. On the model applications, um, uh, the other set of sort of management-directed scenarios was really to try to understand a little bit more specifically what is the relative contribution of point source versus non-point source versus natural sources coming in from the coast. And then to look at, because of how close we are in Southern California to the border with Mexico, is to look more specifically at um, um, the relative uh, contribution of Mexican versus US sources on what on the phenomena that we're predicting in our coastal waters. And then the other piece of ongoing work is to compare anthropogenic effects to natural variability um, and ultimately the scale of um, what climate change has already wrought um, in our coastline, as well as what may be coming into the future. 
The second thing that we're working on is, again, um, our approach to model performance assessment and validation is to understand that it's an ongoing exercise in which we need to be transparent. Not only are we concerned with our predictions of chemistry, but we're also concerned with our predictions of biological effects. And so the OPC um, has invested uh, in um, a coastwide or as to partner on a coastwide um, assessment of coupled observations of biology and chemistry that allow us to link the Southern California bite um, to a coastwide status and trends assessment led by NOAA PMEL. And then finally, um, uh, on the model quality assurance, not only are we working on a performance assessment, but now the State Water Board has just provided some funding to start to work on a quality assurance manual that I think is an important part of essentially model housekeeping, for example, um, keeping track of model versions and whatnot. So we're fo focusing a lot in our discussions um, uh, on anthropogenic nutrient uh, management um, applications and acidification and hypoxia in particular, um, but we are working on other endpoints, um, uh, albeit, M, you know, I think work that um, is more recent and therefore not yet in publication. We have been um, tuning up the model's ability to make predictions of toxic harmful algal blooms um, and looking at environmental drivers, including the effects of anthropogenic nutrients. I mentioned previously that the Southern California bite is not the only geography um, of interest. We're also um, interested and have been spinning up a parallel effort uh, investigating the effects of anthropogenic nutrients on the San Francisco and Monterey coasts. And then finally, um, you know, when we think about climate change strategies, perhaps nutrient management is not the only solution. Um, are there other things that can be done either alone or in combination that can really help? And so um, our team, um, you know, of collaborators have been working on developing models that can help predict the effects of kelp farming, as well as electrochemical methodologies for marine car carbon dioxide removal that um, that we can bring to bear to understand um, how those solutions could be playing a role in a more comprehensive approach to uh, California's climate change strategies. So with that, I will stop and uh, see if the panel has any questions. Martha, thank you very much. I really appreciate the detail in that presentation and I'll, I'll open it up uh, starting with our esteemed chair, Mr. Zhang, uh, any questions from you uh, or the other panelists? I just want to thank Martha for this um, outstanding presentation, really clear. And I, since I already asked a question last time, I think I should let other panelists uh, ask the first question here, if anybody <laughs> has one. <laughs> okay, well, I see a couple of folks with their cameras on. The first person that I saw a camera on just by mine was Alexander. Alex, do you have a question? Uh, I do. Uh, well, I wonder. Uh, probably we'll we'll hear more about uh, more, more technical details about like the physical model setup, right? Uh, we will later. So I'm not sure how how, how technical I want to be here. But uh, Martha, oh, first of all, thanks for a very detailed, interesting presentation. Uh, uh, I am uh, appalled how how much co co collaboration Nova NOS has uh, in the modern enterprise, right? <laughs> this is the first time I learned about this development, so it's been like 10 years. Uh, mm -hmm. So at the time, I, I, I'm NOS actually, uh, doing West Coast modeling, so amazing. Uh, so you, you mentioned, well, as, as far as uh, 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 model dynamics control biology and chemistry, right? So you mentioned upwelling and you mentioned climate change, right? Mm -hmm. But you never kind of specified what was the type of scales you guys are looking for. I understand, like, the model we are going to uh, talk uh, about is mostly to provide uh, scenarios, not like real time forecasts, right? Uh, but, uh, like, are you looking mostly like at the seasonal evolution, uh, that ah, type, or right. you're looking uh, at any interannual variability? Great. Well, so I think that um, the target for what we we're shooting for ultimately, in terms of um, biological effects is, you know, we are sort of basically focused on 
you know, monthly to seasonal, um, and then on interannual scales. Because ultimately, what we understand for this upwelling coast is that there will be a tremendous amount of variability in the impacts on habitat capacity. Um, we want to be able to characterize that natural variability and what is available, and then understand on what time scales um, and at what particular points that are important for the biological life cycles are we seeing those effects. And so then in the validation, what we're trying to do is really understand the model's ability to predict um, on the vertical because we're essentially shooting for habitat capacity. And then how, you know, what are the what are the processes that are responsible for how that habitat is changing over time and over space. Um, so, so ultimately, I think the, um, the, the quick answer to your question is starting a sort of from a biweekly to a monthly seasonal and then interannual scale are probably the most critical um, for model predictions. Yeah, uh, El Nini is, a, is the serious uh, driver for interannual variability, right? Uh, speaking of which, like we are witnessing the, another major El Nini right now or, uh, over there, right? Uh, you never mentioned El, El Nini. I, I, I'm curious, like, uh, or, that's why I asked, like, uh, are we going to talk more about really technical implementation, like boundary conditions and stuff? So, yeah, uh, so, kind of. Uh, I, I want, like you, you say, like you, you had this uh, 197, 2000, uh, and you compare that to 1317, and, and 1317, that, that kind of envelopes very nicely 2014, 16 El Nino and hot uh, in, a, in a heat wave, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at this domain, I, I'm curious kind of how much boundary conditions in a four kilometer model versus uh, atmospheric force will contribute to that. Right, so stuff like that. So I'll be curious to see as we go along, maybe. Right. right. Well, so I think um, here's our intent. You know that clearly, as the science commuter, communicator in chief, I do not have the expertise to really dig in and answer your questions, Dr. Karapov. So the answer is um, the way we believe the steering committee has configured the agenda is to provide you with the opportunity to interact with um, Jim McWilliams and Curtis Deutsch at the next webinar. And so they're really gonna be able to speak to essentially how is the, the, the nuts and bolts of how the model is really configured and intended to be able to capture all of these important aspects of climate forcing um, and uh, you know, essentially the boundary forcings of the model and how well does that actually do in order to um, be able to use the model for its intended applications. So I could try to answer your questions. Um, I've been around long enough to kind of get the feeling for the answers, but I wouldn't want to butcher it. And I think I would um, ask and said for your patience. Yeah, um, right. and, yeah. Fair enough. And, okay, great. Yeah, I think the, the excellent answer, Martha. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think at this level, again, with that kind of uh, view of the process moving forward, you know, what we want to do is make sure that any of these uh, fundamental, if there's questions related to clarifying your understanding mm -hmm. of this overview presentation, Martha can answer those for you. And, and uh, we can stick there. I think we'll, we'll be able to stay on time. Otherwise, uh, we will not be on time. Uh, mm -hmm. The next person, I, the next person whose face popped up on my screen, and I'll turn to now is, uh, is Mike Stugall. Mike? Hi, Martha. That was a really nice presentation. This is some really interesting work. But uh, so one thing that I was wondering, like one of the things that really jumped out to me is the fact that the model seems to be suggesting that there's already an impact of um, decreasing the nutrient loading on the system. And so I was wondering, I, I was just curious about how validation is being done in terms of, I, I've seen the validation that's looking at kind of snapshots and time in comparison, but I was wondering if there are if there's validation being done in terms of comparing trends and temporal patterns in the data mm -hmm. um, between the the field between the observational data and the model results, great, great question. So, so first of all, nice to meet you. Um, uh, the answer is, and I'm going to channel Faisal Khazuri, who is leading that work, is that. Previously, we only had, you know, we were focused on three years um, of model simulations, the 1997 through 2000, that bracketed essentially an El Nino and a La Nina. 
um, and where we nailing these patterns. Now, uh, FaceAll has 20, 20 years of model simulations. Uh, we have chosen to focus on the 13 through 17 time period because it does um, really reflect this sort of more modern version of nutrient management and inputs along our coastline. So I think that ultimately what we were looking for then is, you know, in the ways that the, the observations are uh, spread along the coast, are we able to really track the changes both in, with spatial coherence and temporal coherence for when you would expect them to occur um, relative to the nutrient, um, you know, the nutrient sh inputs coming in uh, along the coastline, as well as some important, I guess I'll call it climate states. For example, we had a, a big warming period um, um, over the, the 13 through 17. What was the effect of that, right? So, so the answer ultimately is yes, we should be able to do this. I think the advantage of when we, um, the, where in the process we are with this updated performance assessment is we're probably right now about 75% done, but that extra 25 gives us a chance to interact with you and for you to make recommendations for what else we should be looking at to make sure that we're squeezing the juice out of that um, out of uh, out of the exercise in terms of um, you know how it can improve management confidence in using the model. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Stuff. Excellent. Uh, next question. I uh, clarifying question. Uh, Neil, I saw I saw you pop up, so we'll go to Neil Bannis. Well, hi, Martha. And uh, yes, I also want to thank you for um, laying out all the work that's been done and and is still going. All in one place. There's there's a lot of good stuff to read for sure. My my first question was actually exactly the same as Mike's. Um, mm -hmm. That reading the Kasuri papers, I was also thinking how valuable it would be to be able to look at uh, change over time as a set of natural experiments, mm -hmm. almost as as a third level to the performance assessment, where you know you you look at stocks and you look at rates and. Um, and then can look at overall functional relationships, you know, the, the overall response of productivity or, or, or any biological rate to, uh, to a driver. Um, mm -hmm. And then you really know that you're, you know, getting the right pattern for the right reasons. So um, uh, I, I guess this has turned from a question into a comment, but um, I, I think absolutely if there's some time to put, you know, our preliminary feedback into your, uh, remaining 25% of that performance assessment, um, that that would be it. But I would also be really interested to talk more in January or or whenever about um, how well the the time span of the observations lets you pin down the overall response of phytoplankton and then the the chemistry to nutrients in particular. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That, that, yeah. So the um, and then go ahead. Oh, oh, no, go ahead. No, I was moving on to another question. So, okay. well, just uh, a thirty-second soundbite in the the Squirb model uncertainty work plan that talks about the performance assessment. There's also another piece in which we want to look more specifically at quantifying the effect of natural variability, and then trying to tease apart because when you're simulating over over two uh, over two decades and these two performance assessments, you're combining climate change and nutrient management at the same time, what we wanted to be able to do is pull apart the relative effect of those of those two things, climate state rather, not climate change, and to be able to essentially, so we have additional model simulations that, um, that hold uh, ocean state um, constant while we change nutrient management. So there are some additional pieces that I would recommend that you both, because you're interested, read in that uncertainty work plan in order to provide additional feedback on um, whether or not you would have additional recommendations for us for how we're thinking about um, both model performance and the ability of model to tease apart um, these variable influences. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other question I, I had for you was on, on the question of, of spatial scale, uh, you know, we're talking about how 
you are already looking at the performance of the model on, on, on multiple scales. I'm just curious from the other end of it, is there a natural spatial scale on which to evaluate the biological impacts? Um, you know, if in a simulation you see a patch of habitat compression over here and a patch of habitat expansion over here, is there some, you know, is, is there some minimum size that that patch of compression has to be to be an important impact as opposed mm. to drawing a box around the whole thing and saying, oh, well, it's just displacement? Yeah, I think that that's an excellent um, question. And I think there's a couple different pieces to the um, to it that are worthwhile unpacking. Um, part of it, I think that um, is part of which Christina has addressed and other parts that we cannot, and we would welcome panel input. So ultimately, um, you know, what Christina Frieder has done is actually look at where, you know, any change um, in that habitat compression is greater than 10%. Um, and so she's already doing some sort of screen to try to, um, you know, to kind of dampen out the noise of the assessment. Um, so that's useful for you to pay attention to how that was done. But ultimately, I think one of the things that we sort of recognize and have, um, you know, have put, um, you know, in the discussion of that paper is that even though we can make estimates of habitat compression, we don't really have the ability to speak to what are the population level effects, right? And so um, ultimately, in terms of minimum size, um, I think that that's where the panel expertise would be appreciated for any thoughts um, or additional ways in which we should be couching our articulation of the results so that we're not over undershading our findings. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Martha. I'm mm -hmm. going to turn now for our last question, a uh, set of questions anyway. We'll turn to Faye Chai. Faye, take it away. Thank you, Martha, for this comprehensive. Uh, uh, overview, and then uh, it seems uh, we have a lot to read, uh, catch up uh, for the January. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. I thought that was an easy panel. To, uh, I thought I, I know the subject well enough, but uh, uh, I have a two uh, kind of a general questions. Uh, first one is seems uh, the focus is a water column centric, the modeling exercise. And it seems there have not been uh, the discussion about the water column and the basic exchange mm -hmm. process uh, in terms of uh, the element recycling, the particular material deposition to mm -hmm. the sediment and the sediment resuspension and how that um, Recycle the different elements. Uh, okay. That that that's my first impression. Uh, I'm glad uh, you're doing this. Uh, other regions as well use the same tools. San Francisco Bay, for example, Monterey Coast. Uh, it can be completely different in terms of uh, the uh, biogeochemical elements uh, cycling. Uh, the sediment is the key in mm -hmm. San Francisco Bay. I, I'm glad that, uh, they are doing that. Uh, so I think that this is maybe um, we can uh, zoom in a little bit uh, to answer. The second one is really this a uh, selection of the organisms that is really uh, a highlight of the the ocean acidification hypoxia impact on the different organisms. Everyone likes the pteropods. They're pretty to look at it. They're a poster child of OA. But uh, I, I think from the West Coast, the OA studies, it seems it's really regional and uh, species dependent on the OA impact. You know, uh, the northern part, uh, same mussels or the oysters and versus the southern part, uh, the OA impact are different. Uh, but uh, I, I'm glad that there is an entrophy, the northern entrophy show up uh, in your one of the figures. It, it seems that uh, there's a lot of uh, those fish 
uh, that respond to the OA or uh, oxygen hypoxia uh, very differently. Uh, mm -hmm. it is, so therefore, uh, the selection of the biological impact, especially related to some of the fish, San Francisco Bay, the, a salmon, the smell is very, very the key. Mm -hmm. But here in the Southern California, uh, I, I'm not quite sure uh, that may be the link with the National Marine Fishery Services. And then so that is the migratory fish or the basic uh, mm -hmm. fisheries uh, need to be considered. Great. So so thank you for both of those questions. And I'll sort of reiterate my understanding of them and then try to give you a um, a, a brief answer, and I think we'll have a lot more time for discussion on yes, both of these. So will. the first question that you had was, you know, it looks like we're really focused on a pelagic assessment. Why is that um, when, you know, you could also be having um, benthic effects? And even the part of your question had to do with whether or not the model is capturing some of the potential sort of sediment and biogeochemical feedbacks that could be occurring. So to answer that question, the model goes to the seafloor. And so it has the ability to do both pelagic, mesopelagic, and, um, and, and epibenthic assessments of how changing seawater chemistry is impacting biology. But when we apply the model to look at anthropogenic effects, we do see effects that go down to 600 meters, but the predominant sort of, um, you know, I think the sort of maybe average effects overall are roughly down to about 200. And so Faisal has chosen um, then in concert with Christina Frieder to focus on the epipelagic habitat as sort of the main signal in which, in which anthropogenic nutrient inputs are impacting the system. So that is that is the answer to your main question. The model does have a representation of, of sediment diagenesis. I would encourage you to interact with um, both Curtis Deutsch and um, Faisal Krizuri to get the specifics of that. So we do have the ability to represent that. But ultimately, in terms of the effect of eutrophication on organic matter respiration, what we're really mostly focused on and capturing in this model is how that's occurring in, in the water column, not in the benthos. So I think that that's the answer to your first question. With respect to the second question, there's a lot to unpack there because you're absolutely right. You know, we're talking about impacts to um, a diversity of marine life, in which some cases we don't even know who we're impacting. And so um, there's a couple, I think, pieces of the philosophy that are um, that are helpful to articulate. Again, um, what we're focusing on are the epipelagic. And so we're looking for pelagic organisms. There is a sort of conventional approach that goes through these assessments and that we tend to focus on the organisms that are most sensitive, the canaries in the coal mine. And for that reason, you can see um, that we're focusing on both pteropods, which is probably recognized as one of the most sensitive pelagic organisms to, um, to acidification. At least that was the, that was our conclusion after doing the synthesis on three taxa. Um, and then for on the pelagic um, organisms or traits um, that we can choose from on the from the metabolic index, um, the northern anchovy represents roughly about the 75th percentile of sen the sensitivity um, uh, in the California current species. Um, among the, the pelagic organisms in that database. So then ultimately what we're doing is reflecting um, a choice uh, of, of a focal organism. But then what Christina did, and I thought this was super helpful, was to look at how that choice in threshold or traits mattered for the, um, 
for the phenomenon that we're essentially assessing, it's a biological effects. So ultimately, I think um, there's plenty more to dig in on this question. I won't elaborate more, but I, I want to um, encourage that we uh, talk quite a bit more about that um, and unpackage, um, uh, uh, unpackage the answer to your question with quite a bit more depth. Thank you, Martha. And Gordon, I'm <laughs> going to go ahead and, and, and move along here with a thank you to those great questions. We'll have another opportunity to move. I want to let uh, everyone know that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll eat into some of the panel's private time rather than short any of the, pers uh, the, the uh, presentations today. I've already been in communication with the CASA folks, so, so they know that. But I wanted to thank uh, uh, Martha. Thank you for your communication in chief. That was actually very, very helpful for me to get a get a kind of a background on it. And we will have and are building our, uh, our process looking forward to create both formal technical presentations on these very deep issues and also a lot of free informal time for you all to have interaction with the modelers and all the partners in this process so that we have this full understanding uh, when we're in person. So when we're in person, we're going to build a lot of time uh, both in uh, in the meetings and outside of the meetings where you'll be able to have that both formal and informal communication. So thank you very much. Appreciate it, Martha. Um, thank you. I want to take a moment to introduce Margie Fredericks. Uh, she's uh, joined us here. She joined us about an hour ago. The, she's with the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences. Margie, thank you for jumping on. I wanted to give you an opportunity to maybe say a few words, if you like to say hello to the uh, the assembled group here. Sure. Hello. Um, I'm out at the fall AGU meeting. So uh, sorry, I was a little bit late, but yeah, I caught most of Martha, your your presentation there, which was great. Um, so I'm a, um, I work in the Chesapeake Bay. I'm a um physical biogeochemical modeler there working uh, for many years on hypoxia and acidification and harmful algal blooms. So a lot of the, a lot of the same issues um, and have worked for um, many, many years now with the managers trying to, yeah, address some of these same issues with nutrient reductions and looking at the impacts on um, a variety of different uh, organisms in the Bay. So, yeah. And as you said, I'm, I'm from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, which is the um, Marine School associated with William and Mary there in Virginia. Thank you and welcome, Margie. It's good to yes. see you. This, uh, as we move into the regulated community's perspectives on the coupled model and, and, and doing some Q&A on that, I'm reminded of a, of a quote that's attributed to Nelson Mandela says, where you stand depends upon where you sit. And I think we're going to move into a little different seat now. And uh, before we start kick it off, we have uh, two folks who are going to lead the presentation from the regulated community. Uh, the first is Jared Boskel. Uh, Jared manages the California Association of Sanitation Agencies regulatory uh, advocacy program. He works on a variety of water quality matters before California EPA, the Natural Resources Agency, related to nutrient management, perfluorinated compounds, aquatic toxicity, recycled water, and infrastructure financing. Prior to joining CASA in 2018, Jared worked in California water policy over three legislative sessions for a local agency and a state trade association. He also served as a president for the National Association of Graduate Students. Uh, Jared holds a law degree from the University of California, Davis, a master's degree in sociology from Northwestern University, and dual bachelor's degrees in sociology and English. Welcome, Jared. Uh, he is going to be joined by Amber Baylor, who is the director of environmental compliance for the South Orange County Wastewater Authority. She's an environmental science with uh, 15 years of management experience solving water quality, regulatory matters for drinking water and wastewater treatment plants. And Ms. Baylor has an extensive knowledge in water quality sciences that she utilizes in step with operations to achieve environmental compliance there at SOCWA. She's well-versed in NPDS, uh, waste discharge compliance, uh, recycled water, ocean discharge, stormwater, biosolids managed, and has held leadership roles in related industry working groups over the last 11 years. She also spent uh, uh, a decade or more at uh, the Santa Margarita Water District, eventually serving there as a laboratory supervisor before she came to Sakwa. Uh, Ms. Baylor has a BA in biology from Lindsay Wilson College and an MS in environmental science from John Hopkins University. Welcome, Amber. I think Jared is going to kick us off. So, Jared, uh, please uh, share your presentation and take it away. All right. Good morning. Is this appearing the right way on your screen? Sure, yes. it looks great. Okay. Well, um, I'm 
Jared Bosco, I serve as manager of regulatory affairs for CASA. Thank you for the introduction, Kevin. Um, very, very excited to have this meeting being held today and to have the panelists here as well as the steering committee members. Um, just as an overview of the presentation, I want to go into a little bit about CASA's background and the regulatory landscape in which we operate, and then talk about some of the proposed regulatory applications for this coupled model, and then um, talk about how we institutionalize collaboration and that being our major strategic approach at CASA, and then close out with our perspective from a statewide uh, angle about the model. Um, so with the, regards to CASA, uh, we work in the legislative, regulatory, and legal arena. Uh, we represent over 130 agencies that provide the collection and treatment of wastewater, as well as the recycling and resource recovery. Um, we do that work through coordination with our utility members. So we have a legislative um, you know, branch and a, a legal branch and a regulatory branch in, inside of our organization. Um, less than 10 people working in-house, but we have a state ledge committee, a federal ledge committee, an attorney's committee. And on the regulatory side, we have a, a variety of work groups. So we have water quality, air quality, biosolids, collection systems. And I work primarily with the water quality side. Um, and so within the that water quality group, we have a variety of subgroups. We work on water conservation, infrastructure finance, microplastics, PFAS, stormwater, recycled water, ocean acidification. And uh, our members are very active in all of these groups and they provide us with perspective so that when we go before um, agencies at the California Natural Resources Agency, like the Ocean Protection Council, uh, we're able to communicate their concerns and their perspectives on how um, the regulations and management decisions should be pursued. Um, we also work with the California Environmental Protection Agency. And so that's with the California Water Boards but also with the Air Resources Board because of emissions and Cal Recycle that works with biosolids. Um, and so to go into a little bit more about the regulatory landscape at the water boards where we predominantly work, you have the state water board in Sacramento, and then you have the regional water boards, um, which are across the state, and there's nine of those. At the state water board, uh, there's division of water quality, water rights, drinking water, financial assistance. Uh, you heard from Jonathan Bishop this morning, and uh, could you go back one slide, please? And um, I think my uh, presentation is advancing, sorry. It was going quickly, but um, maybe there's a timer on there, so I apologize. John Bishop uh, works with um, the Water Board Division of Water Quality, and then at the Regional Water Board, they issue NPDES permits. And so here are some NPDES permits, um, just as examples. Um, I apologize, I'm gonna try to stop this and go back. There we go, okay. Um, here we are. So here are just a couple of examples of permits. permits. Uh, we linked to them, but one is for Los Angeles, the Hyperion plant. They have a big recycled water project um, they're pursuing right now. Another one is for Orange County sanitation districts. This was just adopted, I think, two years ago. And then you have one for the Bay Area, which is um, several agencies. It's a regional watershed nutrient permit, and, and it's one of distinct interest to us, but it has a lot of agencies that are covered under it. And these are five-year permits. They're part of the Clean Water Act. Um, and agencies, you know, every five years go through a cycle of getting them re-adopted, re-approved, and with new requirements in them. So in terms of some of the proposed regulatory applications in the model, um, you know, there are a variety of them. One of which is, um, you know, 303D list and TMDLs, which are pertinent to permits. Um, another one is the ocean plan amendment that the water board's pursuing that sets up a water quality objective so that if that water quality objective is not being met in a water body, that water body is considered to be impaired. And then you develop a TMDL through the 303D list process. Um, there's also, you know, been conversation at the water board about prioritizing or incentivizing projects that remove nutrients for funding. Um, at the California Ocean Protection Council, they have a five-year strategic plan. They've discussed phasing out wastewater discharges um, because of impacts. And they've also invested extensively in the monitoring, as you heard you know, explained earlier. And then kind of finally, um, just within the context of the Western coast of the United States, um, the state of Oregon has their own 303D list process. And there they have an assessment methodology that uh, the scientists from SWORP and others help develop. Um, and that will be approved by Oregon uh, early next year, and then it goes to US EPA for approval. And, and the understanding is that once that methodology is approved, 
uh, Washington and California could pick it up and utilize it in their own 303D list process. And so it's within this realm that CASA comes to, you know, this um, discussion because of um, the implications and the ramifications for our members. So just to add a little bit more color to each of those examples, um, in the case of the integrated report, those three, 303D lists, it leads to a TMDL, which is a total maximum daily load. And it's a permit limit um, if a water body is determined to be impaired. And so in this year's integrated report, it shares in the section on ocean acidification that additional metrics and data sources are being considered for ocean acidification assessments in future listing cycles. And these include model outputs from SWERP using the roms Beck model, which may be used in the future once peer reviewed. And so we understand this to mean that a model prediction by roms Beck could be the basis of an impairment whereby a wastewater treatment facility uh, would be subject to a permit requirement of a TMDL to remove nutrients um, in their discharge. And, and so that's kind of the, the span of why a water quality objective in an ocean plan, and then here this 303D list makes a difference because it would res result in investment from our agencies for capital improvement. Um, to, a little bit more in terms of just to be sure here, um, in, on the State Water Board's uh, policies webpage, they talk discreetly about this work to create an ocean plan amendment, water quality objectives, and a plan of implementation. Um, they also prioritize this in their 2023 st strategic plan, um, doing this ocean plan amendment. But like I mentioned, it's not just the water quality objective, it's also financing projects. And so they also know in the plan, they'll update the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, that's the state's loan program, to incentivize nutrient removal projects. And of course, we want to um, make sure that the board is being thoughtful and fiscally prudent with its financing, but there's also a lot of competing interest. And so as CASA, as a statewide organization, we have members that are pursuing a variety of projects, not just nutrient removal. Some of these pertain to the collection systems that send the wastewater to the treatment plant. You have advanced treatment projects, force main improvements, pump station rehabilitations, lift station enhancements, recycled water projects, upgrades to clarifiers. And so, you know, all of these types of projects are things that year in, year out, agencies seek low interest rate funds and loans from the state. And so prioritizing nutrient removal would shift a lot of that funding away from these projects. And so we have to be thoughtful about that as well. Um, in terms of the Ocean Protection Council and their strategic plan, which was adopted in uh, 2020, uh, target 1.2.3, um, expresses a goal of phasing out wastewater discharge into the ocean. Um, the concern there is that's not really feasible. You can't eliminate wastewater discharges. Um, you have reverse osmosis concentrate and it's in significant volumes and it contains everything that was removed through advanced treatment. And so in terms of a strategic plan, you know, setting that as a goal um, on the basis of ocean acidification that's gonna result in capital projects for our members, which you know, we're thoughtful about um, the cost, the benefit, and how to best do it strategically to maximize the benefit. Um, in terms of uh, funding from the Ocean Protection Council and, and some of the monitoring they've invested in, uh, here's just links to a variety of uh, board approved or commission approved uh, projects. And this really attests to um, how committed the, the state is to protecting our coast and all of the great work that's been done at SWERP and with the other researchers develop these tools to uh, provide us with an understanding of impacts on the coast of ocean acidification from atmosphere, uh, atmosphere impacts and greenhouse gas emissions, as well as anthropogenic sources. Um, the, the final regulatory document I mentioned before was this methodology for ocean acidification. Um, and here, you know, they talk in Oregon that upwelling uh, really fuels the productivity and, and results in dramatic variability in DO and pH. And so we're thoughtful about that as we're dealing with the Southern California bite context as well, but also the thought that, you know, this methodology, if approved in the Oregon jurisdiction and then approved by US EPA, could lead to a precedential impact. Um, so kind of moving out of that landscape of proposed regulatory applications, I want, I want to highlight a value of collaboration that is really integral and core to what we do at CASA. Um, I want to highlight a few examples of that just to, to really solidify that. One is with infrastructure financing itself. Uh, a few years ago, there were some um, you know, longer periods of time to get 
from an award to an executed loan agreement. And so we worked with the State Water Resources Control Board, US EPA, the Environmental Finance Center, Cal State, and, and other groups to really go through a process to undertake an evaluation of how we could accelerate and expedite and achieve some efficiencies with that process, resulting in that report. Um, and that's going forward and it's, it's been a great collaboration and it continues to go forward. Another example is with the state legislature. Um, here, we sponsored a bill on labeling wet wipes. Um, as you all probably know, they go down the drain, they clog pipes, they cause sewer overflows. They're not good. And so we wanted to make sure the consumers knew not to flush certain types of wipes down the drain. And then that statute, with, uh, which was in, acted and signed by Governor Newsom, uh, it calls expressly for a study of collection systems with our organization. Another example of that is with the California Air Resources Board. They just finished a rulemaking this past year to electrify all of the fleet vehicles in the state. And so they started with public agencies. But for a lot of our vehicles, they're bigger trucks, they're bigger, bigger heavy duty vehicles. And so electrifying becomes a trickier situation. And so through this rulemaking uh, and the adopting resolution, the Air Board enshrined this collaboration in, in that resolution saying they'll work with us and others to develop a path forward. Um, the uncertainty analyses workshop that we was mentioned that took place a couple of years ago, our members were involved with that and we worked with Squirp, SFEI to develop that. It was four weeks of individual presentations by experts in modeling uncertainty and it culminated in a three hour workshop uh, on the last uh, day um, virtually where they talked through all the takeaways from that. And so those materials are archived online. You can see the recordings, the slide decks. And then I listed just some of the suggested next steps. You know, I kind of excerpted ones that we were interested in seeing, but it's another good example of collaboration. And then this very project with you all, with SCORP, with the water boards, with OPC, the participants on the steering committee, uh, and with NWRI, um, we're very, very proud of this opportunity to work with you all and to have all of the participants here so that collectively we can you know, review uh, your evaluation and assessment of these questions, and then make decisions on how to go forward as, as a group and with consensus. And so we're very excited for the way that this is gonna provide that opportunity for us to move forward really hand in hand on determining what management actions you know, should be pursued by the state. Um, another good example pertinent to nutrients is in the Bay Area. Um, you're probably all well aware of their work to reduce the loadings there and the issues they're addressing. Um, here you have 37 agencies represented by BACWA. You have the Region 2 San Francisco Water Board. You had SFEI, who's kind of the SCORP of Northern California. And you had Baykeeper, which is the state, uh, the Bay Area environmental organization, all working together on a watershed-based approach um, almost over 15 years, uh, uh, 10 years here. Um, you can kind of see a map of all these agencies around the watershed. They all discharge into the Bay that's a closed system. So loadings of nutrients are very distinct there versus you know, into an open boundary system like the Pacific Ocean. Um, but through three different permits, they're really working to reduce the loading. Um, after the, here's a study that came out in 2018 that was done with on-site visits to all of the agencies. They created a menu of options of if you do these you know, steps in your treatment train, here's the results you can see. This was very useful for us to just get a menu of options and realize, oh, plant optimization, quarter of a billion dollars can get you out, you know, 7%. If you tack on side stream treatment, which um, is not a liquid form, it's through another pathway, um, you could remove 20% remove for three quarters of a billion. But to do that upgrade level um, and advanced treatment, um, there you're going to really drive up the cost of you know, from three quarters of a billion to 9 billion, and you're gonna go from about a 20% to a 55% increase. And so that's really where um, those agencies are working collaboratively uh, with local regulators in the state on pursuing the path forward on achieving this in a way that's feasible. And so to kind of represent um, the dynamics there, here's another great, you know, representation of a slide. The three largest agencies are responsible for about 60% of the loading um, you get about 80% of the loading from the top seven agencies. And so as they're figuring out, you know, how to pursue a management strategy here, you know, these types of, um, you know, graphs and this type of information is really valuable for that assessment. In Southern California, you see similar collaboration. It's more on the water recycling front because of the need there to augment water supply. 
but you can look at just the plan projects and work. And that really requires a sanitation agency treating that water and then providing it to a drinking water agency to either do additional treatment uh, or to convey it um, to a variety of uses. And so, you know, unless you're in a, in a big city that has a bureaucracy for drinking water and a bureaucracy for wastewater, you're probably having to work across agencies, which, you know, just invariably make things hard um, for, for agencies because of all the governance and what goes into that. But still, nevertheless, there's been a lot of great work going into it. And from the governor's perspective, this is even more critical. Um, they put out a water supply strategy in August of 2022, and it calls to increase how much water is recycled by 2030 and by 2040. And it's going to cost a lot of money to get there. And so, you know, in that context in Southern California, if they're investing that type of funding, it's one more competing priority. And um, you have to consider some of the research that swerp has been doing has suggested that we might need to also remove nutrients while we're doing recycling, which drives up those project costs. Now to um, you know represent this in a, in a different way, uh, we incorporated all of the model uh, agencies that are in the coupled model here, and we just used their permitted average dry weather flow. And for those four large agencies uh, in California and Southern California, uh, City of LA, the sanit sanitation districts of Los Angeles County, Orange County Sanitation Districts and City of San Diego, um, plus the ba uh, international boundary, um, that flow is about 75%. And, and so there's these water recycling projects that are gonna be pursued in, in the next five to 10 years without any kind of management action. Um, and then to really refine that even further, if you take it out of just average dry permitted flow and you look at nutrient loads, um, using the numbers in the Mina Ho et al. Uh, paper that's out for publication right now, um, what we find is that 90% of the loading of dissolved inorganic nitrogen um, is, is coming through those five facilities, which means that the other 18 facilities in the model are only responsible for about 10%. And so as we're pondering management applications, management actions, this is really critical for an evaluation of that. Um, one of the questions we have, though, is, kind of how we understand uh, overall the dynamic off the coast. Um, I think with the squirt model and in conversations with Dr. Satula, she shared that uh, they assume it's about a 50-50% split of upwelling anthropogenic. So that 5% or that 10% um, from those 18 facilities over here and, and that division becomes 5% and the, the other loading becomes this portion um, but there's other literature that suggests it's maybe more like 90-10 from upwelling and anthropogenic. This is one of these things we really are appreciative that you all are here for is to, to give us guidance on, on how to understand this dynamic. But if it were to be 90-10, um, all of a sudden, you know, what's really manageable becomes um, significantly smaller. And so we're thoughtful again about, you know, how do we manage and prioritize this and, and what can be pursued? Um, and so, you know, for background, in case um, you're not you know, familiar with this, this is a very generalized table of nutrient removal level, but under the Clean Water Act um, in, in the United States, facilities need to comply with secondary treatment standards. So their removal, um, the total nitrogen in that is somewhere between 20 to 30 milligrams per liter. When you get into advanced treatment, you get to um, about 10 milligrams per liter. But then when you get down to these other stages of treatment, the energy demand goes up, uh, emissions go up and you get to, to higher levels of treatment. Um, and so, you know, as we're thinking about water quality objectives, TMDLs, what level is an appropriate level, you know, this comes to mind is, is informing that analysis. And so kind of to end here with a, a variety of concerns and perspective on the model, um, you know, the charge questions are, are here. And, and to simplify it, it's, you know, in essence, how appropriate is the model for the proposed uses um, how certain are we in the current analyses um, to answer the questions that you heard, you know, asked earlier um, by the managers? And then what investments and steps do we need to take uh, to improve the model going forward? And so, you know, as we think about this complex work of taking science and moving it into policy, how do you take a model that's this complex and transition it for regulatory applications? Um, there are some tools and resources that provide direction and, and guidance on how to do this. One is a California-based resource, another is a US EPA one. 
and some are based out of the uncertainty analyses workshops um, that happened a couple of years ago. But we we took those ideas and we plotted it on an axis where on the x axis you talk of you have kind of the level of quality assurance you need going from low to high, and on the y axis the level of stakeholder engagement going from low to high. And so kind of in the beginning stage of basic research, you have lower standards for the quality assurance and stakeholder engagement. But on the other side of it, as you go to a regulatory process, you know, that quality assurance needs to be really high, but so does that stakeholder engagement. And so right now, you know, we're somewhere in the middle between those two poles. Um, but for us, it feels like there's some remaining work to be done. Um, and, and we're hoping you all can identify that or determine that. And, and provide perspective to the state and to us about what should be done so that as we go forward, um, it's with confidence in the model and, and the results and the actions. And so, you know, I kind of leave this for you to review graphically, but we're hoping and thinking a lot of this work is in process, but still needs to be done and, and representing it a different way, kind of boxes and, and check marks. Um, you know, here's another way of showing it that you know, once we get through all of these phases, to us, it seems like it's then fit for that regulatory purpose. And so we're hoping for that to happen and to kind of conclude in the coming, you know, year or two. Um, but we also know you can't rush science because it moves at a snail's pace, but that's what we expect for the rigor and the standards of science. And so kind of, you know, these different regulatory applications, um, you know, from our perspective, if they're going to be used for any of these proposals, we feel like there's a little bit more work um, that needs to be done so that we understand uh, what it's fit for and how it's fit for different applications. And so the way we think about it is kind of that assessment methodology that I mentioned earlier for organ. I mean, in effect, you have some regulatory thresholds for dissolved oxygen, pH, aragonite saturation. We want to make sure that's that those are right. And I don't know if there's been a lot of review or analysis of the accuracy of those, but my understanding is those are all pretty much rooted in the literature. But assuming you have those threshold right and you're going to run the model, then you go into what are the inputs and, and what numbers are we using? Are we using 97 to 2000? Are we using 2025 to you know 2026? And there's a lot of ways to experiment with that. And then once you get your inputs determined, you kind of go into the model and making sure that's all properly calibrated and validated so that its output um, can be understood. And then, you know, in terms of applications beyond Southern California, you look, well, does that hold for, you know, beyond the bite? And, and that's the way we're, you know, really hoping this process goes through. Um, but the analyses to date, it's really just been those two scenarios they described, ocean only with no inputs, and then every input, not just from a wastewater treatment plant, but from the atmosphere and from rivers. Um, and this is in, in part because of limits in regulatory funding, but these results are that they're able to present are based on very extreme assumptions that include a variety of sources of inputs, not just from our member agencies. And they're also using numbers that are, are a little bit out of date um, and should be updated to reflect the future conditions. Um, in terms of that finding, you know, it, here's the finding that's you know been been you know shared in, in a lot of different contexts and forums. But it's about three months out of the year, offshore impacts are found in 25% of the bite in pH. And I've heard, you know, several folks see this finding and then share it and, and represent it to, to say, oh, our member agencies are causing these impacts. And so, you know, to us, we think, um, well, those analyses weren't really answering that question of what are our members doing? It just was looking at a total loading on the coast. And so to us, it really reiterates there needs to be some further analyses uh, to look at that, that are kind of based on realistic scenarios of future nutrient loadings. Um, and then to the finding itself about pH, um, you know, Swerp had shared uh, to the Region 9 San Diego Water Board that pH was one of the items that um, they needed to work on to improve. And so there's kind of that question for us of if that's been addressed in some of the future model work that's being done or the ongoing model work. Um, and that kind of attests to our not having a good sense of tracking of different changes in the model over time, what's been tweaked, what results are based on, you know, which version of the model. And, and so that's one of these things we appreciate a little bit more clarity on understanding um, that type of versioning or that type of documentation of changes in it. But then moving to the three questions, you know, is it appropriate for the question that's being asked um, and the proposed use? You know, here in that red box is where they observe some offshore impacts 
And, you know, initially the idea was that there were ocean acidification hotspots near the ocean outfalls of our members. Um, but what they found were, was that it wasn't hotspots, it's that it's offshore. So instead of going from causal, you kind of go to correlation of saying, is there a correlation here um, to this? And if so, you know, how do we establish that? And that's a question for us. Um, and, and that really drives into the broader issue of certainty and the level of certainty. You know, this is an axiom, a principle that matters to us. We really hold it up. Um, that the level of certainty required in, in, in the model's predictions has to be commensurate to the cost to per permittees for that management action. And so if a lot of these agencies are going to have to pursue very costly you know, projects in the tens of hundreds of millions of dollars to remove nutrients, we have to be certain that there's an impact that that you know that work would uh, avert in a in a bait, and and so you know as this model is being developed further, we really look to the model for that, but we also have questions, and so you know there was a menu of nine different uncertainty analyses that Squirp offered to their members uh, to perform. I think four of them are being pursued, but that means there's five that aren't, and so we're you know curious how critical are those five analyses? Should those be also undertaken? to increase our confidence in the model. Um, in terms of additional scenarios, you see here, the boxes in the blue are potential ones that could be run. And you can kind of, you know, experiment with these, but certainly we feel like these need to be pursued. And we think it would be beneficial to, you know, consider uh, the large agencies that I identified earlier with that 90% loading um, and then apart from those four agencies and that 90% is this input from Mexico and this contribution from the border, uh, the United States has contributed $600 million in the last, I think, 18 months to go towards a major project on the border. And it's going to work on removing nutrients there amongst other things. But, you know, we think, you know, if you're doing a model analysis for future conditions, that should be updated to reflect that. Um, and then in terms of, you know, treatment trains, we talked about them earlier. Um, here are three that Squirp covered. And we think that you might be able to add um, some of these different treatment trains into the types of scenarios you're doing. So if you're only going to do typical advanced treatment versus enhanced nutrient removal, you know, if you're turning the knob down a little bit here or there, what does that look like? That's another thing where we think investments in the future could go. But ultimately to kind of lay out at an agency level, you know, they're talking about, you know, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars on capital costs to build, you know, um, advanced treatment for our effluent. They have to consider that. Then they have to look at, well, what's it going to take to operate the facility and what's the maintenance cost going to be, that O&M. And they also have to consider the energy costs because um, advanced treatments require a lot of energy. And at this point where our state's portfolio is with renewables, a lot of that energy is not clean energy. So, if it takes a lot of demand, you want to make sure you have the ability to supply the energy demand. And in California's grid, we're working to shore that up. But then you have the issue of if it's not the cleanest energy source, is it just creating more greenhouse gas emissions that are going to create the issues we're trying to avert through um, atmospheric deposition and, and changes in the ocean because of that and driver? So you do that analysis. And, and here's a little chart just showing um, you know, energy demand and, and emissions from different treatment trains. And then you have to look at the opportunity cost because it is such a big project. What are you not investing in? What could we be investing in? And is this the best investment to make? Um, should we be doing something on, you know, other issues like water conservation or water recycling, not nutrients, you know? And then if you decide after you do that opportunity cost evaluation, you should go forward, you still have the barrier of affordability. And so for some very large agencies, they have a rate payer base that's very diffuse. So an increase in uh, the utility bill every month to deal with a large project, it might be tenable. But if you have a smaller agency, you know, one of those 18 agencies that are representing about 10% of the loading, uh, any one of those agencies, much smaller rate payer base, much smaller footprint. If you could build a project, could the rate payers afford it? You know, and if you could site it and you had land you could put it on, what could you do? So that's another question in that evaluation. And so, you know, to conclude, um, with the statewide perspective here, we just want to again reiterate our gratitude to the steering committee members and to the expert panelists for listening to our perspectives and um, being committed to evaluating the charge questions that have been presented to you. 
Um, I want to reiterate that the level of certainty required in the model needs to be commensurate to the cost for permittees to comply with the management action. This is one that's really critical to us. And another one um, that I'll share that's not on here is that progress moves at the pace of trust. And so as we're all collectively in California trying to figure out how to get um, a strategy to go forward, you know, we really want to move forward, you know, and, and do this hand in hand. And so this independent review panel with NRBI is facilitating is that form to do that. And we are very appreciative for you. And then those matters to resolve again are, you know, the appropriateness of the model for the different proposed regulatory uses, um, how certain we are with the model's current predictions, um, with with what they were able to analyze and, and how that bears to future conditions. And then what we need to do in the future um, to invest in the model and, and to do additional scenarios to enhance our understanding of, of a way forward. And so with that, I'm happy to conclude and answer questions at the end, but otherwise hand it off to Amber who will provide more of a, a local agency perspective uh, from Southern California. And SOC was one of our member agencies and Amber serves as co-chair for CASA's regulatory work. So thank you. Thank you, Jared. Amber, take it away. <clears throat> great, thank you. I appreciate the excellent overview, Jared. Um, great uh, presentation. Just gonna go ahead and present my slides. Can you see them okay or? We just need to launch. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Thanks again, Jared. Great presentation. My name is Amber Baylor, uh, and I wanted to thank the wa uh, wastewater industry for asking me to provide this presentation. And I'm also thankful for uh, and honored um, to represent their concerns. And I also want to thank you, the independent review panel, um, for helping us more fully understand the ROMSPEC model and the ro role that it has to play uh, in water quality management applications. Uh, what I'm going Amber, to Amber I'm sorry, but you're still we, we, you're not in presentation mode. And I just wanted to make sure that, that you, from our perspective, we still see the uh, development slide. Oh, you, uh, Suzanne, is is there something we got to do here? She should if you just hit, it should launch when you hit presentation mode. Yeah, so. it's been working today. That's. Uh... Can you now see the? No, try again, maybe. Is that working? It seems to be rejecting her offer. Her offer. <laughs> yeah, it keeps kind of holding up when you press on the, the launch. It kind of pauses. Yeah, like right now, it's kind of paused with a, maybe just maximize the the size of the window on your. Sure. How about that? No. Now we can. Now we can. Yeah, that that'll have to be good enough. I that's think that's the yeah. Doing. That's probably the best yeah. option. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's just go with that then. All yeah, right. sorry for interrupting. No, it's totally fine. All right, so before, uh, we'll just go with this, thank you. Um, so before I um, introduce the agenda here, um, I wanted to also um, introduce a few public uh, agency concepts to help orientate uh, the, the panel to the management's perspective. Uh, speaking for public agencies in general, there are a few principles that remain consistent. First, uh, any time that the public sector is involved in any new initiative, concept, or policy where construction, energy, or operational costs come into play, elected officials' uh, scrutiny comes out and we need to address it. Uh, this is our standard practice for management. Um, scrutiny, we feel like, is an important component of our role as managers as it preserves integrity and protects us uh, from any undue expenses. Um, second, for any virtually any public expenses we are required to justify, elected and appointed official, officials demand this. While I'm responding to this demand, please understand uh, this is universal for managers in similar roles in the public sector. For any initiative that requires public funds for construction and long-term operations, the governing bodies require multiple layers of design review, constructability review, and value engineering review. This multi-layer internal management review will be touched on as SOCWA's role in today's presentation. So I'm going to provide you with the local agency perspective, um, our collaborative role with Region 9 and our NPDES permits. Uh, and then the, I'm going to speak directly to the charge questions. And we uh, emphatically agree with the charge questions. And we're very much appreciative that you're helping um, answer those. 
Um, so this, uh, please consider my statements today as a subset of the so Southern California Bite Clean Water Agency concerns that we are asking you to evaluate on behalf of the public. The following two figures is from our latest results of kelp monitoring in the bite and provides a geographic illustration of the out ocean outfalls um, in the Southern California Bay. While I orientate you to the outfalls on this page, you can easily interchange uh, the name of SOCWA with any other outfall discharge as it relates to environmental stewardship, monitoring, and management review. I'm going to start the, at the north and work my way south as this graphic is a little bit blurry and the presentation is um, not as well, the way I expected today. So we have City of Ventura at the very top of the um, of this slide in the figure and their outfall. City of Los Angeles has two or has the Hyperion outfall, excuse me. Um, LA County Sanitation has uh, two outfalls. Orange County San has um, one outfall. Um, uh, moving into the Aliso Creek area, uh, the uh, Sacco that Sacco maintains, we have the Aliso Creek Ocean outfall and then the San Juan Creek Ocean outfall. Then the city of Oceanside has the Oceanside um, outfall as well. Um, Encina has the Encina Ocean outfall, San Alejo and Escondido share an outfall. And then we have the Point Loma for the city of San Diego and the South Bay um, uh, outfall that the city of um, San Diego also maintains. So now that I've orientated you to the outfalls in this area, I wanted to just to orientate you to the SACWA. So we're a seven members joint power authority. Um, we have a permitted flow of about 78 million gallons, but we only um, utilize about 30% of our flow uh, or about 22 million gallons. There's been um, an immense amount of reclamation that's been happening um, since the 80s um, for um, the development that's occurred in our service area. Uh, we are the NPDS permit holder, a responsible authority for uh, 15 facilities. Um, in the Region 9 area, we have an EPA approved pretreatment program. Our capital uh, assets are about a quarter of a billion dollars, um, but our, our operating budget is about $20 million. And this year we're planning for about $9 million worth of capital budget. So we're relatively small. Um, our, our mission is to collect, treat, beneficially reuse, and dispose of our wastewater in a manner that protects and respects the environment, maintains public health, and meets local, state, and federal regulations. So that moves me right into uh, how our role fits into this review of plume tracking. We actually began uh, plume tracking back whenever we were evaluating um, potential spots for marine protective areas. In 2012, our Aliso Creek Ocean outfall, uh, we actually uh, undertook a study without a compliance requirements to help assess where these marine protected areas are. Uh, City of Laguna Beach is very uh, focused on the environmental stewardship and that's something that we take very seriously. So we wanted to understand um, what those are and you can see an articulation of our management questions, trying to understand where that plume was um, almost a decade ago. In that study, we have looked at 21 sites around our outfalls uh, using some physical techniques, and we also used ammonia uh, as a tracer uh, for this. We sampled at both mid-depth and we sampled at, at the surface to understand the way that our plume moved um, around. Um, however, we did not find ammonia at any of our locations, and the question still remained of where our plume was. So that moved into some of the formulation of our monitoring questions. You can see the boat that we utilize and many of the dischargers along the coast have a similar type of uh, uh, rigging operations for research activities. We've been monitoring since 1975. You can see um, um, some snow-capped mountains in the background. Um, this is required by our NPDS permits. It's a robust, robust monthly monitoring and we, uh, we endeavor for special studies that is needed. Uh, and the reason why I bring this up is because we have a prolific amount of information of where we actually were looking for sewage debris. We have a quantitative scale that looks at any type of uh, uh, surface level sewage re reaching the surface. Um, and this is really related to some of our impact to swimmers um, of that plume moving on shore potentially. And so we have uh, a, very, a lot of uh, historic monitoring in this area for uh, plume tracking and do that on a routine basis. So the reason why we are sampling at mid-depth and actually at the surface as well is that we're kind of relying on the design of the ocean outfalls and the thermocline, uh, where in one of our outfalls, the Elisa Creek Ocean Outfall, it it's very deep. It's 195 feet deep. 
Um, there's a thermal line trapping that's um, pretty consistent at that outfall. And that is part of the design of these outfalls um, specifically. And whenever we are measuring our bacteriological samples at the surface in the mid -deep depth, we're actually looking to see how much that plume is potentially spreading. Um, and our outfalls maintain a, a, an excellent compliance record with any bacteriological standards, uh, me meaning that it's not actually needing uh, moving to the surface and that the, the outfalls are actually um, operating as designed and constructed. So moving into our uh, future studies, not also, uh, these are not um, compliance related uh, studies, but we actually began hydrodynamic modeling uh, back in 2018. And the reason why we did this is because we were getting down to scenarios um, from the 15 facilities where they were looking at potentially low to no flows due to reclamation efforts. Uh, and in some of the simulations, we actually saw that we were doing a much better job at some of our dilution. We we're getting higher dilution fact factors uh, because of the lower flows um, that we had at our outfalls. Uh, but our anti-degradation did not allow for that, um, and that we would have to make um, we'd have to make some modification, engineered modifications. So our engineering committee um, has looked into those potential modifications um, to this. And the reason why I bring these studies up for the independent review panel is because we have a breadth of uh, institutional as well as uh, uh, knowledge in the consulting world um, on exactly how our outfalls are operating. Uh, and uh, as that information is available, we can certainly share that with additional modeling efforts into the future. So as Jared touched on region nine, uh, we're looking at um, this region here. Uh, SOFWA actually represents uh, the only entity in Region 9 in Orange County, South Orange County, as you can see right here. Uh, and so we represent a kind of a, um, a perspective in Orange County that's maybe a little bit different than uh, San Diego, but we have a united um, discussions related to some of our uh, regional needs as, uh, as we don't have groundwater basins in South Orange County. So uh, that reclamation effort has been uh, a very strong uh, discussion and in our planning efforts. Uh, however, we do have two of the six ocean outfalls, and as permits develop, they start at City of San Diego, and they actually um, move upward, and so we have uh, the luxury of being able to be involved in these discussions to understand what exactly will be needed for our permit compliance, and we can plan accordingly. So that collaboration continued um, with our um, with our regional boards. We actually began looking in 2018 um, a, a series of, of workshops that were looking at what technologies were really available for plume tracking. Uh, and the industry, as well as academics, and um, Scorp was also at these meetings as well, um, trying to understand uh, their model and how that uh, worked with potential requirements for our technology. And there's a considerable amount of information sharing, not only with our industry personnel, but we would also share this information with our regional boards as well. So moving into our um, um, into the uncertainty series that Jared had mentioned, uh, I was actually a panelist on the uncertainty series, and there were four webinars in that uh, uh, series of uh, workshops. Um, however, it, the sensitivity analysis was not presented at that time. Um, we're still looking at potentially trying to understand uh, those sensitivity analyses of those key parameters, um, just to get more detail. And just to orientate you all, uh, we are made up of, um, you know, all civil engineers and we report to the board um, that demands a lot of details associated with exactly how models work and function. And so uh, that we have to make sure that we are explaining in, in great detail um, how these uh, things work. So um, when we look and we request some of these analysis to uh, provide additional management uh, assurity, we're, it's really in response to making sure that we understand the details. Um, presentations on certainty of the numeric modeling were also discussed. Um, and model, model application was also discussed. Um, I think what stuck out to me as uh, a panelist and really as a manager trying to understand these items is um, I, it was a presentation related to applications in the Chesapeake Bay and, uh, and really how the modeling versus the monitoring uh, could be incongruent at times. So trying to resolve the incongruencies over that over time was definitely um, an important 
point as we look at potentially use of this model uh, for regulatory purposes. And as noted previously by Martha today, there is a model uncertainty work plan and we would love to be able to see that as well and engage. Uh, SOQA is not a member of SCORP, but we are definitely engaged and have been uh, historically um, as noted as, a as we've been represented as a panelist as early as 2021. So uh, we, we um, enjoy and we look forward to more of that collaboration. So moving into our collaboration in Region 9 permits, uh, in March of 2022, we had an NPDES permit and our NPDES permits are really our compliance permits uh, to give us, uh, you know, what we will be just, you know, um, having as far as monitoring and, um, and requirements with the Clean Water Act and uh, Porter Cologne. Um, there was some high, there was a high profile capital project uh, in one of our permit hearing as well. And we were presented with a slide prior to our permit hearing, trying to you know, kind of understand if California was missing the boat on some of the policy questions uh, related to this. And this really kind of prompted our board, the SOCA board, to try to understand, you know, and, you know, like I said, uh, we are also have one of our members, City of Laguna Beach. This is uh, very important. They have, we have a very sensitive environmental population. And our board members have said, you know, you need to understand if we're causing a problem. And then if we are, we need to understand how to fix it. Uh, so we have not obfuscated any, you know, responsibilities as it relates to uh, if we're directly at, you know, um, uh, if we're directly attributable to a problem, then we want to be able to fix this. Um, so we were a little bit, um, um, this question actually prompted um, a series of comments uh, actually by our board members and our previous board member or our previous general manager um, had worked with the executive of officer, Dave Gibson, at our permit hearing and, and, and said if there was any um, additional um, changes or updates to the model that we would be present at that time. And that really kind of began, began our collaboration with SCORP and Region 9. And Region 9, actually, the board members asked us to bring come back and um, kind of give some of those updates. So like I said, you know, our questions is, is there a true problem? Uh, how can we help? Um, are there technical services that we can provide in kind? Uh, there is a provision in our, both of our NPDES permits uh, that uh, require a technology review uh, of uh, the available plume tracking technologies. And so our board made action, uh, awarded a contract to actually review, which I'll talk about in just a moment, uh, to review uh, these as part of just our normal, you know, engineering requirements as part of our, um, our daily capital and operations uh, review. So uh, we actually presented those uh, those findings and uh, the report was actually provided to the independent review panel that gives uh, a lot more detail than I'm going to talk about today. Um, but we provided that to uh, Region 9 and they asked us again to please come back and share uh, because part of what our SOCO board funded is that we found a few omissions that we talked about and that um, we committed to actually fixing those um, and then helping to rerun the model. Um, so we are looking at, you know, obviously being a partner to assist uh, where is needed and uh, respond to really our citizens uh, and questions about, you know, those attribution questions. So these charge questions, again, I'm uh, very, very grateful and happy that we have these charge questions and that you all are, you know, devoting your time to helping us understand because as managers, uh, we're not, you know, the scientists who are doing this on a day to day basis. So uh, we're extremely grateful of your uh, your assistance in uh, answering these questions. So moving into the first question, Jared touched on this and we have this question of, you know, is the model, you know, inputs and he provided a, many different scenarios. Uh, but is it a 90 10 scenario? Is it 50 50? Uh, upwelling, as you all know, with your expertise in this uh, California current system, there's only one of four major uh, upwelling systems in the world. Um, so, can the model really realistically resolve some of the complexities that were actually uh, exist in an inherent manner here? Um, what you see on the left hand side is from the Howard paper, which shows that there is an order of magnitude difference between upwelling versus effluent. 
And so we're really trying to kind of scratch our heads here and say, well, and, and I know that Martha had mentioned this, that she was also shocked in these findings and um, attribution, but uh, when upwelling ha is happening in a seasonal basis, and those are what the model is predicting, um, how could really the difference in an order of magnitude between upwelling and our effluent uh, really push it past that tipping point? So really trying to understand some of the basis uh, of these questions is very important for us. I wanted to kind of again show our outfalls. Uh, here we are, there's many of the outfalls that are located on submarine ridges uh, and canyons. Uh, you can see how our outfalls are right next to the continental shelf drop off. And so we're really trying to understand when you look at a particle of say, for example, nitrate, um, moving throughout, um, you know, an upwelled system, how does the model really tell you and discriminate between one particle of nitrate from upwelled systems versus a particle from our, you know, from our, um, our outfalls and understanding uh, that they're, that the analytical approach employed by the modelers is uh, an off and on type of scenarios, uh, but really, how do you really discriminate between those two different particles? And then um, we have had questions and we met with Squirk, so definitely appreciate their time at their office. And they actually came down to our office as well. Um, so definitely looking at continuing that collaborative uh, conversations. Um, but our outfalls, um, how are they really accurately captured in the model? It's our understanding at this point that uh, the models aren't um, kind of sitting on the seabed floor and they're kind of floating in space within those. And are they really capturing the dynamics that we're seeing within um, some of the additional plume tracking um, as well? So, you know, as related to inputs to the model and the charge question, um, how does the model actually accurately account for these items? Uh, and then, you know, if you look into transboundary flows happening in the Tijuana River, I mean, this has been a problem since the installation or the, you know, since the 1940s and 50s of an outfall that didn't really work at, at that time. I think it's uh, reached more historic per, um, uh, perspectives now with uh, larger flows. And so are there transboundary flows contributing to some of these acidifications? It's not really clear because we have only had a one small um, series of uh, scenarios run at this point. So really trying to understand those differences is important. And then um, as noted, I did provide you all with uh, the uh, independent review or the independent review panel, the um, our management review. Uh, that was part of our technology requirement as part of our NPDES permit. Um, we feel that the light attenuation is absent and our local mixing from our um, from our discharges is also omitted. Um, I will reserve this because this is a very technical discussion. Uh, and I believe Dr. Scott Jenkins, uh, who is a professor emeritus from Scripps, um, is actually available to present to you all on his findings um, specifically um, to help actually improve the model. And uh, when we met Dr. Uh, Jenkins and I, when we met with Squirp at their offices, I mean, he had nothing but gushing remarks uh, for uh, this for Squirp, um, indicating that this is one of the most complex problems uh, that they're trying to detangle. And this is a, an immense uh, and huge, as Martha had pointed out, a grand challenge uh, for the scientific community. And so I really wanna make sure that it's clear that um, we are not uh, wanting to discount any of the a very important work here. We're just really following through on some management questions that we have and hope that you all consider in your review as well. And moving into that perspective of some of the academic findings, uh, what you see here is uh, part of the work, the body of literature uh, that I think Martha has referenced and we've seen also is uh, on the right hand side, you see the McLaughlin paper from 2021. And what it does is it's a Langrenian approach where you're actually charging some of these particles um, throughout the, uh, the flow, throughout these systems. Um, as well, but you know, one of the questions that I have and still hasn't been resolved is how do you, or is there any literature which we haven't found on some of the Langrenian inputs similar to what's upwelling? So you can really distinguish between those particles of water that are moving through the simulation, what's the outfall and what's the, you know, what's the upwell nutrients and what's the, tip, the tipping point? Because 
When we also, you know, do the due diligence on some of the literature as well, what we see is, uh, and I'm grateful to hear too, that there's uh, uh, funding now available for Squirp and their co colleagues to look at the whole California coast. Uh, there's a paper by Desmet um, in 2022 uh, et al. Sorry, and they look at kind of the largest um, uh, pushes of ocean acidification, and what they're finding is that global CO2 is actually uh, pushes the, these things. So resolving that context of local effects versus um, uh, larger effects here um, is really important. Uh, on really understanding and discerning who's um, the attribution because there's only so many public dollars that we can uh, actually commit to these items and we want to make sure we're getting it right. And then, um, you know, there is a, a kind, of, kind of conversation and it would be really helpful to see some of the uncertainty uh, analysis and sensitivity analysis because there's a question of how many free parameters are really uh, there in that model. When we actually began the uncertainty series, uh, we were looking at 10 free parameters and with 10 uh, percent uncertainty, you know, you could have a 100 percent uncertain model. Um, now we understand as we're looking more into the model and we've we've been able to look at about 90,000 lines of code uh, that there are potentially 90 free parameters. So truly trying to understand each of the assumptions uh, at each one of these points and how some of those uh, items in an academic setting um, really transfer over to a practical manager's perspective is really, you know, what we're trying to understand here. So, you know, how many free parameters are there uh, and what kind of uncertainty does that result um, as you kind of put all of these pieces together? And why that's really important is, you know, to our question and our point earlier about inputs and ch um, charge question one, um, those solution inputs are important in accuracy because, you know, those outputs from the and those associated uncertainty, uh, we're seeing kind of a different scenario. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, there's five of the six outfalls in the Region 9 area that are actually uh, going through and using some AUVs or autonomous underwater vehicles uh, to look at the plume and how far it's actually moving offshore. Um, and around away from these uh, discharge pipes. Uh, we're seeing effects from lagoons pulsing into areas that having a much more dramatic effect um, on the movement of uh, some of these nutrients into, uh, into the Southern California Bight. And so when we see um, real, uh, you know, real AUV measurements, uh, difference from some of those outputs, understanding what those uncertainty um, is on each one of those parameters are really of utmost importance. Uh, and I do thank Martha because um, she did indicate that potentially in the future they could um, receive more of this information um, as part of their modeling efforts. Hey, Amber, I want to I want to just real quick, I want to point out it's 1145 and we've only got the panels to noon. Uh, I'm OK using up most of their time, but I know you've got you know a lot of slides left. I'm so. gonna, I only have three more. So OK, good. Thank you. I appreciate the help. Thank you. OK, thank I'm you. Gonna skip over here. Well, one of the really quick thing is the biological parameters are correct. Um, so we really want to make sure that those biological parameters are correct. Um, we see that some of the literature uh, references um, uh, parameters that are a couple decades old. So we're trying to make sure that we understand those differences. Um, and really the time scales, we have scenarios from 97 to 2001, and then you know a short amount of time, and then 2013 to 2017, another shorter amount of time. Uh, and then we see different models that have, you know, a much larger um, periods of time. So really, you know, which one of these models are we um, basing decisions off of? Um, and so when we see things and uh, things for the clean water settlement partners uh, providing this, we see rapidly declining, declining nutrients um, uh, based on reclamation uh, in the orders of 95% to almost half since 1990. Um, really are the model results uh, reflecting the management decisions that we're making on an everyday basis. Um, to that point, version control is essential to charge question number three. Um, we need to make sure that we understand. So I'm glad that Martha has indicated there'll be some more QA so we can kind of follow the documentation along. Um, you know, is, the, is this going to be an EPA approved model? Um, how long will that take? Really, is this a five, 10 or 20 year process? Is there a funding roadmap? Um, we need a clear understanding of support that is needed. So 
Um, my daughter reminded me today that there's 13 days left for Christmas. So I'm just going to give you my 13 high updates. And um, so, you know, the complexity in the curve, California current um, and wind is extremely variable. So there's a lot of literature that's showing that variability and are we capturing it today? Um, we understand that there's a decade of modeling work um, and that, um, and we really appreciate that. Um, new attribution of coastal uh, eutrophication by um, wastewater dischargers by kind of a smaller group of investigators. We're not seeing that across um, the world. Um, there's macro level review that carbon dioxide is from the atmosphere, uh, atmosphere, excuse me. And then the, there's a much higher amount of upwelling from offshore. And then kelp, belts, kelp beds are actually declining despite nutrient input. Um, biological parameters are not updated for today's decision-making purposes. Um, some of these halves are episodic while wastewater discharges daily. Um, South Coast Air Quality Basin, uh, to you know, to uh, uh, Jonathan Bishop's point about the uncertainty, is still in non-attainment for nitrous oxide. So our dischargers have actually, you know, from the permitted um, um, equipment, we've actually reduced our NOx down um, tremendously. But yet, we know that CO2 is actually still uh, pushing us into non-attainment. Um, there's no transboundary flows included to the model, and it's still unclear if the model is at fine, can, at fine scale can actually definitely state that dischargers are causing eutrophications. Um, so with that, you know, we, ha I ha we have the references. We have been following the literature associated with uh, this model quite extensively um, to make sure that we're trying to understand it. But we still have a lot of uh, chief concerns uh, with this model. So that with that, I want to thank you. We're very grateful for our independent review panel to um, answer all these very important questions. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. And we knew we were ambitious in building this agenda, but I want to ask, uh, I'll turn to the chair now and ask if the chair or any of the panelists have any questions for either Jared or Martha about the regulatory overview that Jared gave and the perspective kind of a statewide of how what the regulatory approach is and how the CASA member agencies are thinking about this. And then also the perspective from the local agencies that, that, that Amber just shared. Gordon? Um, I guess I should leave the opportunity to other panelists. I do have some small questions, but I think it's probably better if other people have like our, uh, higher level questions. Thank you, Mike. I saw you jump in first. Oh, we'll go to you. I guess um, I have kind of a general question to for both speakers, just to see what their perspective on this, because there's a lot of talk of, is the model accurate? Is it good enough? Um, and so kind of my perspective often on these things is, well, the model's never going to perfectly simulate reality, but the model may show that even though it's getting the amount of eutrophication wrong, that there are some consistent patterns that agree with the data in terms of you get X, X percentage additional eutrophication when you have, um, when you have these um, coastal inputs. So in your framework, like the, the way I think of it is, it's good if it's showing the, uh, results and maybe we're not accurately getting the 2023 conditions because the model's only been run to 2019. But if you see that with you know X amount of nutrient loading, you get Y amount of eutrophication, then you can kind of extrapolate that with maybe we've decreased the nutrient load, so now it's X minus 10, and we can extrapolate that it's probably Y minus 20 now eutrophication. Is that kind of how you guys see it? Or do you think, or are you hoping that the model will really simulate the current levels of nutrient load? And that's what you need to see from a regulatory perspective. I, I hope that question makes sense. Jared, you want me to take this? Okay, excellent. Uh, well, I think from a management perspective, we're seeing a little bit of a discrepancy on, you know, kind of a monitoring. And so to your point about what we would maybe need to see more emphatically, you know, we're still missing, uh, you know, uncertainty and sensitivity in the model to really understand if it can actually accurately represent things that we're seeing um, in the ocean uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. We have some historic information 
uh, the literature also kind of states on kind of a, from a reference perspective, uh, they see different things and not really able to to capture some of the upwelled, um, you know, nutrients um, and discriminate those between uh, the outfall. So, you know, from our perspective, we need to make 100% sure uh, that we're really, you know, contributing or pushing it over to the point. And I just don't think that we have enough information or data um, to really get to that point. So from, you know, from, an, from uh, you know, as a comparison, for example, with the visual plumes model, which has an extensive amount of documentation, a versioning system, uh, code that's exceptionally um, open um, and available for the public. Uh, that's just not what we're seeing here for an implementation for us today. So without an engineering review of that um, information, uh, I, I think it's just really difficult for us um, you know, from the regulatory perspective to kind of maybe get up to speed with the researchers are saying. Not that we can't, because we're, we've are we been trying and sprinting to get into a world that, you know, it's not our specialty uh, by any means. But we do have a big push with our environmental communities to really make sure that we're, you know, up there. And we have funding from all of our agencies to, you know, get us to the table in, in that discussion. So I think we would really need to see a lot more um, of the background data um, to be able to kind of make sure that that was more fit for regulatory purposes. And then associated capital improvement as well. Understanding there's uncertainty with everything, but at 100% uncertainty with 10 free parameters, it's just really hard for us to, you know, kind of make that make that uh, case for our ratepayers. Okay, thanks. Faye, I believe you are next. Yes, um, two things. One is really the tracking of the alpha. And uh, you, Amber, you mentioned that you use ammonia as a tracer. You couldn't detect any of ammonia in your locations. You were doing the sampling. And then yet you used FDOM with AUVs, but you see this, you know, very. So I, I think. I, without knowing or getting the details of your plumes, uh, you know, visualization or the modeling activity, it, what is the correct tracers of your alpha? I think that this is the indication your ammonia went through this rapid, very rapid a, uh, biological chemical changes. Uh, once you so I, I think that this is really the part uh the physics is, is the first order but we need to know what are the the tracers or, or the detect uh I, I I I don't know I think that this is the really the physical part the second part striking me is 90 percent of the nitrogen loading from upwelling versus 10%, of the other one is a 50% versus a 50%. Those are really spatial and temporal dependent calculations, right? Your upwelling not operate a year round. Your outfall, your discharge is year round, if I, if I understand correctly, but it may, you know, different tides and et cetera. I, I think those the numbers need to be put in the context of the space and time. Those are the two questions or comments in general. Yeah, no, excellent. And you know, to that point, um, we actually uh, are using a concept, I'm sure you're familiar with a signal to noise ratio to really understand what those background influences are uh, it, because of our vast experience of trying to find our plume. Um, our environmental community is very much uh, adamant that we try to find this. So uh, really trying to employ the correct physics uh, on tracers and help that information to apply to any additional uh, updates is very important to us. Um, your point about space and time is quite excellent. Uh, it's something that we're still trying to resolve in a mass balance approach versus a uh, Langranian um, kind of modeling, uh, moving through these boxes. And it would be very helpful for us to actually get all of these details um, so that we can actually, all, you know, kind of follow along on the technical side as well. So, um, you know, to, to that end, having all the code um, in a more public repository uh, so that we can dig into it more is would end documentation of how those um, 
uh, program shuttle, you know, between each other is exceptionally helpful for, uh, would be very helpful for us. So uh, point well taken, and we definitely are on a daily discharger. So we're not telling anyone to turn, you know, stop using their toilets anytime soon. So <laughs> it's a key question. Alex, I believe you are next. Well, I don't have any particular questions about the injurious talk. I was amazed by this uh, problem where you, to clean water more, you actually have to start burning more fu fuel. So that was a very interesting note. Yeah, in, with regard to uh, that question about uh, appealing mass of nutrients versus what uh, people discharge. So do you compare apple to apples there? Like like, like what phase, uh, Chai say, said, like, so like that huge amount of nutrients is, is it like the appearing signal or do we have to compare the discharge to, to the anomalies basically, right? So just a question out there for everybody because I'm not a biologist or chemist, yeah. But I totally enjoyed, I, I enjoyed the talks. It was very interesting. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, appreciate it. Neil. Uh, just a, a, a couple of quick comments or you know, comments that open up really long discussions we don't have time <laughs> for. I, I just wanted to thank you both. Um, I, I feel like you know, with your your list of more specific questions beneath the charge questions, I, I'm, I'm seeing better what we might be able to contribute as a, a panel. One thought I had is that I, I wonder if the, um, the right analogy for this model system and its role in, in policy is less, um, like an engineer's water quality model and more like a global climate model, um, you know, which, which has a, a sort of a protocol for evaluation, but it's a different one. Um, you know, increasingly, I think the global climate model community is moving away from detailed scenarios and more toward um, just a summary sensitivity, like the amount of CO2, of cumulative CO2 for global civilization that produces this many degrees. And you find that a lot of scenarios, um, despite all sorts of differences and uncertainties and details, collapse onto a single curve, basically, for that. So you know that, that kind of analogy might uh, point a way forward for um, communication or, or you know, a, a sort of mutually agreeable presentation of results. It's something to, to talk about more. The, the other question, maybe this is a question, <laughs> not just a comment is um, I'm noticing this difference in scale where to some extent, it seems like it's a, a concern about individual outfalls, individual plumes and tracing the effect of that one plume of nutrients out and out and out. And a remote effect then seems a bit odd because we're, we're accustomed to thinking of the effects of a nutrient source as being local. But on the other hand, as soon as we start adding up the nutrients for the, for the whole bite, we're almost assuming that everything is sort of getting stirred together into one biogeochemical process. Um, and I think oceanographically, you know, there, there's something to both of those. Um, but maybe the question, since um, this was ostensibly a question, is um, do the do the dischargers expect to be regulated um, individually as individual outfalls or cumulatively as um, a total body of, of nutrients that just sort of only matters cumulatively the way global CO2 matters cumulatively? I, I think that's a really great question. And in the Northern California context, they do expect to be regulated as a, as a group and, and they're kind of left to themselves to figure out how to prioritize achieving the reduction of nutrients that the regulators set. Whereas I think right now at this junction in Southern California, the idea is that um, it would be individually driven and in that each individual agency that is discharging nutrients, uh, there would be some kind of assessment by the regulators of what that contribution is and needing to reduce it. And kind of in that framework of there's a, a water quality objective within the ocean plan, and they'll have to make sure their discharge can meet that objective. And, and so that's kind of the thought is it'll be more individual in Southern California at this time. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jared. And again, we knew we were being ambitious in, in this agenda building uh, for this first webinar. We really appreciate the contributions uh, from Mr. Bishop, Ms. Eckerly, Ms. Sutula, Mr. Voskel, Ms. Baylor. Thank you all very much for coming today. I appreciate your inputs. Um, 
We're going to retire to a, to a panel working session now, which obviously not going to be 30 minutes long, but we do want to retire now and, and, and have everybody uh, uh, sign off with a reminder that webinar two is on January 9th, 2024 at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, we'll get uh, the meeting materials and related stuff for that out to you uh, at least a week before. And uh, would encourage you as you uh, uh, begin to think a little bit more about this project, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, peel, please feel free to reach out to myself or to our staff here at NWRI. Our goal is to is to get to the bottom of, uh, of our charge questions, which uh, we're going to start a little bit of work on here in just a, in just a few minutes. Um, once again, for those of you who are not members of panel, now is the time to log off. Uh, panelists, uh, you can. I would suggest 